Today is September 12th, 2019, and we want to thank you, Jim Clark, for welcoming us from the Computer History Museum to capture your story here for our collection. Sure. I'm Marguerite Gong Hancock, and I'm here with Mark Weber, and we're here to start at the beginning. If we could then, for the record, could we ask uh, when and where you were born? Take us back to Plainview, Texas. Sorry, that, let's just say it is September 16th. So we have it. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. I'm in the wrong over? day. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> just to get it in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't born in Plainview, Texas. I think I was born. I was born in Fort Worth, but my parents moved to Texas, Plainview, um, shortly after I was born, and can't remember much except when I was maybe three or four. You know, start being aware of my grandparents. Um, but I went to public school there, population tw uh, 15,000, maybe 12,000 even. But during, the, during that phase, it grew from 12 to 15,000. I went to a, um, yeah, a couple of different elementary schools as my parents moved around in the, in the small town. And then uh, uh, ultimately I was in high school. I played in the high school band, I played tuba. Um, and didn't play sports because I've never been drawn to sports. I was more drawn to music, so I played in the band, in the marching band, so I didn't have to do physical education until uh, I was a little bit of a, not a problem kid as much as mischievous, but it was a fairly intolerant uh, time you know, spankings and paddlings and that sort of thing when you misbehave in school. Paddling, literally paddling. At school. Wow. At school, yeah, in the band, typically. Um, of course, I got a few paddlings and then eventually I graduated into high school where the band director was a lot less tolerant and he, he kicked me out of band. And uh, a short, maybe a year later, I was asked to leave high school for, for disciplinary reasons. It was, and ironically, I suspect most of these things happen all the time now in some public schools. But, yeah. So I left and, and eventually decided after being out about nine months and not going back, and I was playing cards at the used car dealership and generally a miscreant and then uh, I just I decided when school reconvened the following year I decided that since I, I felt lost and left out and so I joined the Navy at, at the age of 17 and spent about four years um, just under four years in the Navy <clears throat> where, I got, where I got a lot of training uh, when when I was a Initially, out of boot camp, um, I didn't. I'd never taken a multiple choice quiz. This is how long ago this was. So, so this is almost sixty years ago. And I, I, they thought I had cheated on this quiz because I marked a couple of answers on one question, but I thought they were both correct. Right. So they said, "Well, we're going to send you to a little bit of a discipline thing. Send me to." to what's called the fleet for on-the-job training. And in this little interval of about nine months, I went through a whole variety of pretty dirty work kind of stuff. And, it, and one of the things I uh, did during that interval is I, I borrowed some money from a guy because I was short of cash, you know what, you didn't get paid much. And uh, I think I borrowed Twenty dollars or something, and the next payday I had to pay him back twenty-eight dollars, <throat> and that's where I learned. I guess you might say that's where I got my real on-the-job training because that's that was my first exposure to finance, and I um, I kept that locked away. I never did it again. I said that's just it's pretty harsh, but then when I got out of that particular tour of duty, I went to what's called Class A electronics school. And uh, by this point, I had learned that I'd, I definitely learned that I'd done the wrong thing in joining the Navy and dropping out of school. So 
I was just more focused, and uh, that that first week of the school, I, they they taught basic algebra, and I I aced the week. I got you know top score. So they had a little program where they got some of the students to teach. In fact, that course that that night week that night school I should say was taught by a former student who was ahead of me. So they asked me if I wanted to do that, and I said sure taught basic algebra review. And um, so I took that assignment, but the only, that, that, that entailed uh, four nights a week. I mean, uh, four nights, one week, Monday through Thursday night, teaching, and then you got the rest of the month off. So it was one week out of a month mm-hmm. you had duty. So that was my duty. Instead of lots of other cleaning duties and things like that, my basic duty was teaching. and. One of my bunkmates um, also got um, the same job, and um, I had saved some money when I was in the fleet, and I <clears throat> took my savings and started one of these loan funds, <laughs> and began to loan money. and I and with the proceeds, I made a lot of money, and I I paid him to teach my class, so I ended up doing nothing. That's my first little. For a and business, it, it, you might have called called me a loan shark, I guess. But uh, so I did that the whole time I was in the school, and I and I did come out top of my class. So I learned that I was able to at least do better than twenty five other guys, and and uh, I got choice of duty station. I moved back to Norfolk, Virginia, and I got on a ship which which did all sorts of touring of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean and Norway and places like that. It was, it was a, you know, a destroyer, got a missile destroyer. And, and um, so I, I didn't do any more loan business, but I took, started taking a lot of correspondence courses to kind of remedy my lack of education. So history, American history, plain geometry, uh, sophomore English, uh, just remedial courses, and um, I did well at that, but there were a bunch of people in my rating, and uh, there were so many that they we had an overflow, of, and I was, you know, progressing up through a rating system, but there were a lot of other guys too, and they put us into menial labor, cleaning, mm-hmm. yeah, because there were too many of us, and they needed other people doing some of this menial labor, so I wasn't really happy with that. And eventually, I I made friends with a guy who worked in personnel, and I had been trying to get off the ship, but they don't allow you if they don't. You know, the captain would always reject it. So I met this personnel guy, and and he said, "Look, if you insist that they put your request all the way up through the chain of command and send it off the ship, it will come to me, and I will get you off the ship." So I did that. And sure enough, I got I got an assignment to move to a reserve training ship where I was a senior most guy of my ranking, um, and uh, it was just a little guided missile. I mean, a little destroyer escort anchored full time in the Mississippi River. I mean, you know, docked full time in the Mississippi River. So that was a fortuitous thing. And from there, I st- I took uh, night school courses in calculus and finite math and and um, English so at, was, at Tulane University. What was, you left, you dropped out, you, you ended your, your high school time as a junior, and what was guiding what, your own pursuit of what you were studying? You were shaping your own you know, classes that you were choosing. In high how school? Were you, no, I mean in this later time, how were you choosing what you were going to be studying? You were shaping, in a sense, your own education. Well, I was basically taking what I thought was necessary I mean, English, history, um, finite mathematics was kind of a, a it, it set theory and, and, and things of that nature, finite math, uh, combinatorics. And so I just felt that was a good thing. And I took that. And then I thought, well, calculus is, I wanted to be some kind of scientist. So I took calculus. And then I finally, uh, uh, this was in 1965, so I, I uh, 
January of 65 was coming and there was a program where if you uh, got accepted to a college, you could get an early discharge. So I applied for that program, got accepted, and then I got um, discharged, I think it was five months earlier than I would have, or three months. So I left and went, moved back to my home in Texas, armed with three, three A's in college. And uh, started to, uh, but I was married and I had a child, and I was, uh, yeah. During this time, I got married and 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 I needed a job, you know, to make my, no. My parents certainly couldn't afford to put me to college, so <clears throat> I started going to Texas Tech and working for my uncle, and then I got a job at the fire department. All this time working full time while going to school full time, and eventually a guy who had taught me calculus. I was his top student. So he, he offered, he said, look, uh, after you get a few years of education, apply, write me and I'll hire you at Boeing. And he was, he was a supervisor at, at, on the, Boeing ran the first stage of Saturn V moon program out of a place called Michoud, Louisiana. And they built, literally built the big Saturn V first stage. Boeing was in charge of that, Chrysler was in charge of the of the second stage, and um, I worked for Boeing, and I kind of dived into computer, the computer world, pretty fervently. I was I was like always pretty focused on things like that, uh, any kind of technology, and and um, I I made some modifications. The, the guy who had worked there um, was sort of my partner slash supervisor. Well, he resigned shortly after I came there and took another job somewhere. And there was a, a computer uh, that was heavily used. And I got a, made friends with the computer operator, the guy who, well, the maintenance engineer. He was an older guy and he showed me how to key in instructions and what kind of computer? It was a GE-235. It had a card reader, it had a bunch of tape drives, and sitting off in the corner was an unused disk drive that was new and had never been installed. So I was watching this computer be in operation literally 24 hours a day. It was just always in a backlog. And I was talking to the maintenance engineer and he said that that disk drive would speed it up a lot, but no one had ever put it in use, and so I sat down and read the manual and learned how to, to use it, and I took the program that was taking all this time, and I began to alter it in my own little copy of it to use this drive, and it finally got it working, and he, um, not he, but uh, the, my, my, uh, the guys who were submitting the programs to this computer, it was, it was creating analog valve cycling uh, sequences to just make sure that the that the rocket opened all valves and let in various you know fuel um, and I, I didn't know that any, anything at all about that but I made this program do the same thing that the tape drive program was doing and they tested it and said yeah it works and suddenly it went from 24 hours a day to four hours a day so they, Boeing was quite happy with me after that and they just said you look you just come in and do whatever you want. And that, that's when I began to really dive into physics. Prior to that, I was, yeah, studying physics, but to be honest, I, my grades weren't so good because I was heavily involved in computer programming and this thing and learning that. But once I got freed of sort of work responsibilities of any, of any significance, um, I started working by studying, and I spent the next years uh, getting a bachelor's degree in physics, and then I got an early, um, I, I, I quit, got a, a fellowship, and entered in graduate school studying for a PhD in physics. Uh, but this is 1971, and it wasn't physics, I think, well, Physics Today, which is a magazine that physicists read, um, I would read it and it would say all of these physicists getting PhDs from places like Harvard, MIT, Yale, so on, Princeton, and they didn't like 
the jobs they were getting. And I thought, well, what am I doing? I'm getting a job. I'm getting a PhD in physics from Louisiana State University, but which by then I couldn't afford to go to Tulane, so I went to to uh, LSU. And uh, by then, um, I just sort of looked at it. I was trying to get my degree done, but every time I would finish, my 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 advisor was I was I was too quick, you know. And he didn't he would he was going to be embarrassed to let me get a PhD with you know, after a year or two. And I kept thinking, well, I'm, I'm married, I got these. Now, by this this time, I think I had, yeah, a, a second child. So uh, I was really eager to get a good job. And I just got discouraged about physics. And a friend of mine pointed to uh, University of Utah as having a computer graphics department, which I didn't know much about. But I was good with geometry and physics. Physics involves a lot of geometry. But had the job prospects or the program work better, you, you enjoyed physics as a subject. You would have been happy to continue. Oh, I very much loved okay. physics as a subject, but I didn't think I was going to be able to get a good job. Okay, but it was the practicality, not it's just the topic. practicality of that. So, uh, and it, you know, this is when computer science just sort of emerged as a real discipline. Uh, a guy named David Evans, who used to be the chair of the physics department, oddly enough, I think, at, at Berkeley, UC Berkeley, was a Mormon and he had been convinced by the University of Utah to come to Utah and start a computer science department. And this is all fortuitous for me because Dave was a brilliant guy, really nice guy. And he had in turn convinced Ivan Sutherland, Chuck Seitz, Tom Stockham. These are all sort of truly brilliant name people to come start this department. Anthony, uh, Tony Hearn, a list guy and list guy and um, so, you know, I just fell into it, really. I went there in 1972, and it uh, might have been 71. No, it was 71. And I wrote my thesis for a master's degree. Um, moved to Utah, uh, dived into that, kind of took up with Ivan Sullivan. Worked a little bit for Evans and Sullivan Computer Company uh, to make a little extra money, and um, I basically kind of it, it was it was one of these things where I never envisioned myself able to go to a place like MIT or Yale or Harvard or any of these quote you know Ivy League brand name schools. I, for me. Even the choice of University of Utah, I would, I did not apply to any major schools, despite the fact that I had. By the time I was in graduate school, I made all A's, you know. So I, I kind of kicked myself up into the into the different orbit. I could have been, if if I'd had the money, I, I would have been accepted in those schools because of all my academic work, as being, you know, A's, and that means something uh, to these to these um, graduate programs. So I got in to Utah with no problem, and it just turned out to be very fortuitous that, you know, here I, I, I had all of these people who were from all of these schools that I would never have tried to get into. Yeah, I was the world center for graduate school. As, as my instructors. So it was, it was really kind of the best of all worlds. A new department, a new discipline, sort of, computer science. I had already made my chops in computer programming, so I was no... I'm no slouch at that. I just I just fit right in, and I learned how to design hardware. Check sites was was a great um, inspirational hardware. I, I still recall I came in. He was my fresh my kind of my freshman advisor, even though I had a master's degree in physics. They made me go back and take these freshman courses, and I still recall Chuck saying to me. You really ought to take this course. It's it's called Introduction to Computer Logic. And I thought, I mean, it's a freshman course. I mean, I mean, a first year graduate student course. And <clears throat> there were two hundred and thirty people in that course, and and I I um, I took it and I came out top of the class, right? So he said, well, maybe you can just be a uh, you can you can learn it while you while you're a teaching assistant. So I became a teaching assistant for the course. Which was nice, and and uh, but I did learn a lot through Chuck. It's just that I didn't need to be a, an official student to be to be learning it. 
But I learned a lot in the computer labs in building hardware. And Chuck had these phenomenal labs, and I learned a tremendous amount. I was always in this complete awe of Ivan Sutherland. He's a, he's a brilliant man, for all, obviously. I mean, he's probably in the 80s now, but because um, I'm 75, but he, he was just he was about eight year, or five to eight years older than me. But he, just his lucid thinking was kind of a uh, eye opener. And Chuck Seitz, in the way he described things, you know, quite an eye opener. And Tom Stockham, the guy who invented the digital recording formats and his image processing. And, you know, I never took uh, any of those courses, but I kind of learned them all by osmosis. I mean, learned the image processing stuff and signal processing. And, were there and any, Bob, oh, sorry. I was going to say, were there any particular occasions or conversations or projects that you were working on that kind of stand out from that time with any of those people or, or I didn't do anything per, particularly significant with with Tom Stockham but <clears throat> there was a group of people um, Ed Catmull was there um, Buitong Fong who who uh, a few years later passed away from cancer but um, you know, we, we had, there was just a community of guys trying to sort of do the next new thing in computer graphics. And Ed was more interested in the, uh, in computer animation. So was Ivan back then. In fact, Ivan started a company then called the Electric Picture Company. And Ed was going to go join him and they, they, I think they even tried to raise money to, to form a computer anim animation company. And it was, I don't recall the economics of the times, but I think they just couldn't raise money. And uh, so I haven't kind of, this all happened over a period of three years, but during that time, I made digitized copies of the aircraft carrier Enterprise and w was thinking about making an animated film. I made a, pic I made a, a little, 3D model of Snoopy flying us off with camel, right? And was you know, have him take off and land on the aircraft carrier. I was quite interested to some degree in computer animation, but uh, then I, I instead kind of got more drawn to hardware, more drawn to this head-mounted display that Ivan had been part of, had, had built as part of the DARPA uh, funding. And uh, I think he had built that prior to coming to Utah and moved it out there. It was just mechanically connected to the room, but it was, it was cool to be able to put that on. And it's kind of the first of virtual reality, if you it will. It is, and you yeah. know we have it in the museum. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you were involved directly with that. I mean, it was already built it several built. years before. Yeah. You were using it. Did you come across the, Larry Roberts had the Lincoln wand that was like a magnetic wand that was meant to work with that, I believe. Well, I know there was a thing called the Lincoln One, but what we had, I don't think that ever, if it was wireless, it, I don't think it ever worked. To, at least it never got moved to Utah. What did work was three attachment points on the ceiling with monofilament line coming down to the little thing that you held in your hand, and as you moved it, those three fishing lines would change length, and there was a shaft encoder on those to detect how far you were from those three points. So you could calibrate that and, and work yourself around in a, a little space. So it, it had a three-dimensional wand, had buttons on it, it had the head-mounted display, the two little CRTs along. And yeah, I, so I built a, a B-spline surface design system for interacting with these services in real time. So it was, it was, a, it was a combination of computing, dealing with these modeled surfaces, bicubic primarily surfaces, and you could have this big, large sheet. It was, a, it was more of an interactive modeling PhD. Um, I look back on it, and I think it's like a lot of the other PhDs in those times, they were, it was a new field, and 
people were accepting a lot of different things as unique. It doesn't, when I look back on it, it doesn't seem very innovative or, or unique. But then on the other hand, neither was Fong shading and neither was Gros shading. Probably the most unique thing done then was what Ed Camel did with, with um, subdividing surfaces and, you know, to a point of resolution that it didn't matter. And, uh, and then, yeah, there, there, there were things evolving out of that. Uh, map mapping, you know, mapping textures onto surfaces, the kinds of things that are routine in games these days were predominantly all invented then uh, with, you know, speculative reflections and things of that nature. Uh, environment mapping, that was all kind of done back then. And a lot of that came from Ed Catmull, but I was involved more in the hardware side of things to a large degree. Um, I left, I, Fong graduated a year before me, um, and uh, I, he got a job at Stanford. I was always envious because when I graduated, I got job offers from UC Berkeley and UC Santa Cruz. But I, um, let me back up for a moment. You know, here, here's a high school dropout from Texas who never went to a brand name school. <laughs> and I, I just, I can't overestimate the difference University of Utah and Ivan and Chuck and all of those people. It was like, you're suddenly introduced to people who can open doors for you. I would have never gotten a job offer from UC Berkeley or UC Santa Cruz or probably would have never thought of even trying. But Dave Evans was on my PhD committee. He had been a professor at Berkeley and he was ready to offer uh, high recommendations and so was Ivan and, and Chuck. And so I, um, I'm super lucky. You know, life is one of these set of lucky events, and, and you just got to be able to take advantage of them when they happen, or even be aware of them. You know, to grab the, you know, to grab the the ring as, as you go around. Because that's how I feel. I feel like it, it was extremely lucky for me to be able to land in a, in a you know Silicon Valley for the most part. But I, I went to UC Santa Cruz. I was a bit of a hippie, and I thought that'd be a good place to go. Uh, one, one, sorry, one last yeah. thing with Utah. So that was also a center of excellence for ARPA, right? For what? ARPA had made Utah like a center of excellence or something like that. Well, like yeah, the, there, there were initially four, five, six nodes on the ARPANET. But also the graphics, I think they had given it a special Because status. of Ivan. Yeah, yeah, Ivan and, yeah, it, it became a, a focal point for graphics. That was a lot. So graphics, image processing, Tom Stockham, graphics, uh, 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 Ivan, and I mean, Tony Hearn, Chuck Seitz, all these other people there, Dave himself, um, you know, it was a, it, it was a an enormous gift to Utah that they brought there, I think. But how, it was also, obviously it was on the ARPANET very early. Did you use the ARPANET and did you feel connected to the larger kind of ARPA community? Um, we were, we had a, a Bolt, Baranek and Newman had built this um, hardware that connected us to the ARPANET. It was like a huge cabinet, you know, something that these things have is one little tiny chip these days. But uh, it was like a huge cabinet of, and we were one of four or five or six places. I remember, um, um, what's, what's the name of the, Leonard Kleinrock. Oh, uh, and yeah, UCLA. UCLA, but, but. Network Measurement Center. More uh, SSI. Oh, ISI. ISI, yeah, in yeah, Information Sciences Institute. Um, they were a, a node. We were at Utah, maybe Caltech, I don't remember, but. SRI. Um, no, up in up 
Stanford probably was, I don't know. Well, yeah, Stanford was SRI. Mm -hmm. SRI could have been. But Carnegie Mellon, a few places. And they were all people, look, Ivan had been a director at ARPA at the age of 21 or 22 or something like that, crazy. And when I was just starting to college at 21, he, he was already director of DARPA. <laughs> but he, um, he helped seed, helped be part of seeding all this stuff. And frankly, the fact that they were all at Utah made a huge difference. And uh, so they were one of the nodes, one of the early nodes on the ARPANET. Did we use it? We, used, we started using it for messages and email, I guess. Was I aware of it? Not terribly at that time. Uh, it, was, it was a big box that sat there. And, but I was worried about getting a job. Remember, my, I mean, I had two kids. I just wanted to get out, get a PhD, get a job. And uh, so I did. And then I moved to, uh, to California. And I spent four years there. Um, very frustrated because I felt like I was kind of out of the mainstream. You know, I should have been at Berkeley. I, 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 can, I confess, I made a mistake, I felt. Even though uh, UC Santa Cruz is a nice place and had a great faculty, and I basically, at the end of three and a half years, I was just frustrated because uh, a huge teaching load. It was considered and you, you, you know, a young faculty member is gonna, not going to be judged very much on how they teach. They're going to be judged far more on how they produce research. And so that was the, the dilemma of being there. And I, um, I just got frustrated and I quit. And move, I, I, frankly, I started talking to Berkeley and Emmanuel Blum, a very nice um, um, theor theoretician, computer scientist there, had been the department chair when I was applying, and I had maintained contact with him when, when I had originally been offered the job. And he said, Jim, I, I'm quite, or maybe he still was the department chair, he said, I'm, I'm quite certain you'll get back, get a job offer. But evidently, the head of the engineering school didn't like the fact that I had turned them down the first time for Santa Cruz. And you know, they didn't, they didn't take me. So I said, <laughs> well, so I moved to uh, where Ed was. Ed, Ed Catmull was out at, uh, out here in New York, actually, at New York Institute MIT, of Technology. Right? Mm -hmm. And I spent, better part, I got married and spent the better part of a year, remarried, I should say, spent the better part of a year uh, trying to build a 3D digital, uh, 3D sampling system where you could, essentially record some key points in a person's body as they moved and then map those onto an animated figure. The idea was to do computer animation. All of that has been, that get done, gets done routinely now, but, but um, I, was, I was building a system for that. And that didn't work out because I thought, Alex Shore, the guy who, who ran that place was a bit of a nutcase and he would he was like Khrushchev. He would come in and beat his shoe on the wall, you know. <laughs> he, he was, he was a, a, and I just remember thinking, I, this, I, this is, like, I, I'm trying to build my career and this is going to, how's this going to work out? And uh, it turns out he was spying on everyone. And I wrote Dave Evans and asked him if I could get a job. I said, I, it, this, this place, I said, I'm going to finish this project, but I don't want to work here. And he, he was spying on me and he fired me for doing that. Mm. that you know, it, it, I, I was extremely upset at being fired. So I went back across the country and met up with some people at Stanford. And, and, and fortunately, another great fortune in my life was to meet uh, Forrest Basket. And Forrest and I are very close friends. He was just out here uh, spent the weekend with he and his wife, with, with me and my wife at, at our country house and um, about a month ago. And, but Forrest and I are really good friends. And um, we became good friends in large part because over the years, you know, we just worked together on these things and he came, he eventually, well, 
get ahead of myself, but he even came to work at, as head of R&D at, at Silicon Graphics, which was my first company. But, but what Forrest did was hired, got convinced Stanford to hire me. And so I became an associate professor at Stanford. Um, and that's where I learned, you know, the first year that I was there that summer, uh, I took, I went to Xerox Park where Lynn Conway and, and uh, she was teaching the VLSI course that, was, that she and Carver Mead had written a book for. And, you know, I, I attended that two week course and I came back super inspired, started teaching that fall, <clears throat> working, yeah, hardest I've ever worked, I think, because I was trying to make up for lost years. You know, I, I felt like I've got so much I've got to do. Then I created this thing called a geometry engine, which is a novel way of putting integrated circuits to work and building a computer graphics engine. And um, <clears throat> um, yeah, and I taught 160 graduate students, which was a big challenge. Um, teaching kind of what computer architecture, what I learned from Chuck Seitz. But it, the way Stanford wanted you to teach it involved a lot of, frankly, I knew they were useless techniques because I could see via integrated circuit design taking over and you're a lot less concerned about gate minimization. Yes, it means something, but it means a lot less when you're talking about gates on, a, on an integrated circuit. But uh, a Klein McCluskey, McCluskey minimization, Ed McCluskey was a faculty member there, great guy, but you know, I, I went in, I just refused to teach that stuff, and so I taught, I taught VLSI to my logic course. And was, you were, um, were you using or involved with the Moses uh, thing for, that Danny Cohen was involved with for um, what it was, you could send your design and have it uh, prototyped. Yeah, he rapid prototyping. He he got involved with that later. He was in, in Danny was became a really good friend of mine. Um, uh, a great guy. He, that's how I met Leonard Kleinrock and those folks because he was down at uh, USC ISI, I think it was called. But um, they started that rapid prototyping pro prototyping thing after oh, okay. that, that right. summer. Um, by the way, after uh, the year I graduated, Chuck Seitz and Ivan both took faculty positions at Caltech. And, they, and, and Dave stayed in Utah, but um, two of the guiding lights moved. It's just that window of time when you were there, yeah. when there was this constellation of people. You, is it right that you're office mates too when you came to Stanford with John Hennessy, is that right? Mm -hmm. Speaking about yeah. the other people that became you know, relationships that were important. Yeah, Later. Forrest hired me. I landed there, John uh, and I, he was an assistant professor, first year there, I think. And we shared a secretary. Um, and um, Over the course of the year, as I did the geometry engine, I needed help. Uh, I needed a microcode compiler. John wrote it. He worked along with me, and and uh, he was teaching his classes. I was teaching mine. He, he's, John and I became really good friends. I, I, I um, eventually even convinced. My mind, if my memory serves me properly, I had I, I was so enthusiastic about integrated circuit design that I I told John I said you, you know you guys at, at computer geeks should computer architects should should build a CPU on on a chip and that's where the MIPS design came from. But I he and I and Forrest started teaching and a, a guy named Skip Schrader who was visiting from IBM started teaching this, this course on CPU architecture. 
and they wanted to build a, you know, a pipeline architecture and essentially it was, it was a set of things that weren't hard to understand. It's just I was doing all this other stuff and I, I rapidly faded from teaching that. And I demanded, uh, by this time I had taught two, I taught a total of 360 grad students in two semesters. And I just told Stanford, I said, and Forrest by this time left and started to work for DEC as the, their vice president local R&D guy in, in Palo Alto. And DARPA, because of the work I had done on the, on the geometry engine, they just asked me to be the PI, principal investigator to replace him. So I kind of nominally took that over, but John and I were doing that for us left and, and um, I don't know, a couple of years go by and um, John had done the MIPS project as, a, as that class, they, they began and they created the MIPS architecture. Meanwhile, um, I was winding up a set of graduate students and convinced them to start a company. And so I wrote a business plan presented it to some venture capitalists, got some funding, and, and we bailed in 82. Uh, I convinced these guys to join me. These were grad students getting PhDs, some of them, two of them. One was a math PhD, Tom Davis, he had, he had already gotten his PhD, but we all left and started the company. And there were no IP issues with Stanford? Well, I. No, I, uh, there were none because they licensed everything to me that I had done exclusively. So turns out that that license wasn't really necessary. We redesigned the geometry engine to be more discreet using gate arrays and things of that nature. And so, but a year and a half go by and we finally introduced a product. Meanwhile, John is thinking about what to do with MIPS and I convinced him, I said, you should, you should go start a company to build that CPU. We need something better than the 68,000. Meanwhile, Sun was developing the Spark architecture and we kind of competed with Sun. So John went out, created MIPS. We licensed the design, started incorporating it and eventually bought the company. Silicon Graphics did. And John went back to Stanford and all during this time, Forrest eventually came and started being the RD of SGI. And I, you know, that was a intense time of my life. It was my, it was my, the entirety almost of my education seemed wrapped up, wrapped up in Silicon Graphics, because it was, it, it became the leading computer graphics company for sure, making workstations. And, um, you know, I plotted or, or worked my way through that for quite a few years. As it turned out, it was a bad business thing for me <laughs> because I didn't make. Uh, yeah, yeah. Before we get to before we get to the bad part of the business, if you could tell us on the front end a little bit more, sort of the essence of your business plan, what you saw as the business opportunity, and then the funding, which turned out to not be the ideal situation. But if you could tell us sort of the technology that you were you talked a little about the geometry engine as you were shifting it the business model and then the funding, how all those came together with your essential team? Well, I, I remember I actually was good friends with a woman named Ronnie Goldfield, but she had been married to, her previous name was Ronnie Caulfield and her husband was Frank Caulfield of Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Byers. So she was acquainted with startups and I was trying to get this thing off the ground and I didn't have any money and she loaned me 150,000, which became stock at first. This was essentially a bridge loan to get, or seed funding, if you will. And uh, I eventually, uh, through her, I think, met Glenn Mueller and um, Mayfield Fund. I also met Don Valentine, um, uh, Pierre Lamont of Sequoia. Interviewed both of them. 
<laughs> and um, I think what happened is I, you know, I wasn't a business guy, and here I did. I picked up a guide to writing a high technology business plan, and I so I just followed that. I wrote a business plan, and I made create a slide deck, and I hired a bunch of guy. I got a bunch, a bunch of people as the officers, and they had all been officers. The CFO had been the CFO of Dryer's Grand Ice Cream. And I figured, well, he's been a CFO, that's good enough. Wasn't very, he didn't know anything about cost accounting, but uh, he, he came in and I got a, a guy who had worked as a, at, at, you know, in setting up manufacturing facilities for computing products and I mean Silverstone. And I got, um, who else? I guess I, I don't recall the rest, but we went in and presented this business plan, created a slideshow, and I remember still, I didn't know what a balance sheet was, but I, I presented this, this pro forma balance sheet, right? Uh, I remember the, I think it was Don Valentine, this sort of, where's your pro forma balance sheet? And I, I couldn't bear to, I couldn't bear to tell him I didn't know what it was. But then I met, you know, Glenn. Glenn was a great guy. He was a good friend. Grant Heydrich was a partner also. Um, those are the two key guys. They came on the board. But <laughs> I guess in part because I wasn't a business guy, when they offered me, you know, I think it was eight hundred thousand dollars for forty percent of the company, and I, I took it, thinking it was better than nothing. And perhaps it was, but um, over the years, they were on the board. Uh, we did a Series B. I met Dick Cramlick. Like he came on the board. A guy named uh, LJ LJ Seven Seven Rosen. Uh, they invested in Series B. So, you know, I was in kind of in the big times. They're all good people, very good people. But over the years, as that kind of unfolded, the company raised three or four rounds. I mean, it was a manufacturing company, a computer company. It had to build a direct sales force. It was a significant undertaking. It took a lot of a lot of management. We, we ended up going, uh, uh, we had one CEO, uh, Vern Anderson was his name, who since passed away, but Vern um, what, didn't, wasn't really that kind of guy, a computer company guy, so we ended up, I probably used a search firm and we found Ed McCracken. He came in, um, he, he was an HP guy. And he hired some former people from HP and got, got up and going and we had a sales force and we it just you know, started selling and, and started doing well. We were, we were the, the leading computer graphics company in the world, which I will say kind of irked Ivan. <laughs> because Ivan, I remember Ivan told me one time, he says, on the geometry engine, he says, you realize you violated every patent Evans and Sutherland has. And it was a kind of deflating comment coming from him. But so, so it was. And uh, we, we, we made things a whole lot easier. To program, we created a thing called the, geom the graphics library. And that was a tool that, frankly, a person named Martin Newell and I had created in the process of teaching. And it was a, a bit of me copying him, and because Martin was a, a, a good, very close friend of mine and a partner for many years, and we were going to always start this together. He ended up sp spinning off and joining some CAD company in Chicago. But um, but Martin. <clears throat> And I had created the, the to get, uh, jointly 
not knowing it, we just created a set of tools for teaching people how to program graphics. It involved a certain way of dealing with the software, because that's what we used, right? Software to teach people computer graphics. And, and uh, I had used it teaching my graphics classes at Stanford, and it just naturally was what we developed to drive the graphics at SGI. And that became what became known as the GL, uh, Graphics Library. And then Kurt Akeley, one of the founders of SGI, worked really hard to turn it into something called OpenGL. And by then it was incorporating all kinds of fancy shading and MIP mapping and environmental texture mapping and all this stuff. So it, it, it had a lot of the elements that are now built into every device out there. But um, um, over time, I kept saying to the management of the company, We've got to produce low-end products. This is not, the, the world is going to eat us from underneath. And I, could, I cannot really overestimate the difficulty of getting a company. As it turns out, when we first started, even though it's silicon graphics, our first workstation was like $75,000. And the thing that you shouldn't overestimate is once you start in a particular price point, you build an entire sales force, all the commissions, the whole, everything about the business, gross margins, you know, you get, you get seduced by gross margins, you get all, but the world is fighting the battle down below. And here we were, fat and happy, getting huge gross margins, and I kept saying, we gotta move down, gotta move down. And uh, <laughs> it is truly ironic because to complete that story, um, 12 years later, I said, I, I've had it. I can't do it anymore. It's driving me crazy. We're going to get blown out of the water someday, and I don't want to be here. That's what was going on in my mind. Nothing to do with the Internet, nothing with, with Mark Andrews. And I didn't even know who Mark Andrews was. I was just basically worried. I didn't want to be there when the place started falling apart. And I was convinced it was because I, I, I thought this high-end focus was not going to work. And after I left, and it already started Netscape, they bought Cray Computer. So that tells you the mentality of Ed McCracken and all of the other management were just seduced by us having the most high-performance computer in the world. And meanwhile, I didn't care. I was gone. <laughs> But, but that sort of extrapolated off. And incidentally, let's, let's continue that story because while I was gone, I was doing, I'd already made a fortune and I was not even thinking about that. But they, they, bought, they acquired Cray, everything after uh, our IPO at Netscape. All of these people who never approached me about a job at Netscape, because I would, I would have hired them, but I wasn't going to approach them because I wasn't going to you know, cannibalize my first company. And it just, I think the, the company culture assumed that I had tried to do that at SGI and that the management didn't let me. Because I was known as a bit of a troublemaker at SGI, guilty, because I was trying to get things to move down market. So um, I, that's why I left in total frustration. And I just said, I got to get out of here. Can you help paint that? Oh, go ahead, Mark. I was, well, was going to ask just because you say it went way back to the beginning of SGI. You wanted to go down market. Um, so I don't know if you should, but ask sort of what was, had, had they done what you recommended, what direction would that have been? And yeah. also, is Sun a similar? Sun seemed to have some of the same issues. But is, sure yeah, you know, what my, there's uh, T.S. Eliot has an interesting poem called Burt Norton, which a memorable line is, what might have been, what have been, what has been, point to one end, which is always present. Basically, you can't, 
you never know what would have happened. But in my mind, at least, um, I, I think to some degree, SGI and Sun were destined to run into the PC market and fail. PC was getting stronger. But in retrospect, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I can tell you the people who benefited from, we, from what we created but didn't benefit from. Uh, and this is continuing that story of the apogee of SGI, which happened during the dot-com boom, right? 96, 7, because I left in 94. Uh, what happened was McCracken left. I don't remember the details. I wasn't there. Uh, Tom Jermalek left. Boris Basket left. I wasn't even in touch, so I have no idea. But uh, Bob Bishop, who was the international sales guy, took over. And they weren't doing well. They're, they're going down. And um, he sold the high-end graphics division to NVIDIA. That's what, if, if we had had our wits about us, you, you know, I believe, in, the silicon graphics would have been in silicon, yeah, as opposed to a workstation business. But it's sort of an idea that, that, that they, they benefited from all the work we did, you know, all of this OpenGL, all of that, making the hardware run efficiently and making it available in chip form. So, yeah, NVIDIA is a couple hundred billion dollar, $150 billion company. And, you know, we never were worth even a tenth that. So, <clears throat> and it's surviving. And it's mutated. You know, NVIDIA has, has mutated and, and taken advantage of, uh, you know, uh, machine learning. And, and, you know, the advantage, when you have, the, the main thing they took was a bunch of really smart people. SGI was renowned for having some super good high quality engineers and thinkers. And um, so in any event, I branched off and, and, and left, right? While that continued and happened. And, but that's, that's, that's my story. I, I believe they could have been NVIDIA if they had had a low end focus instead of a high end focus. But back in the mid 80s, say, were you thinking to go you know, head to head with PCs or, I mean, how, when you say low end, what would that have looked like? I was worried in the early days of SGI about our price point compared to Sun. But Sun encountered the same problem vis-a-vis -vis the PC that we would have encountered. It's just that SGI had this graphics knowledge. You can think of the, the intellectual property of SGI was largely in its graphics. We had a CPU, we had MIPS, Sun had Spark, right? All of those are as they are, but we had this, we were uniquely knowledgeable about graphics, even more so than Evans and Sutherland. They had kind of stayed in the flight simulator business and we had, um, yeah, we, we had this knowledge. And it's just that there was no one there to, to apply it to integrated circuits and and truly build accelerators for PCs. That's where NVIDIA got going. They started building graphics accelerators for PCs. It was the, we, we'd have probably never done that, but in retrospect, that's what we should have done. We, we started as a workstation company because Sun hired Bill Joy and they made the original 68,000 board that we used that Andy Beckelsheim mm -hmm. had designed, we, we, we used the same board and Sun suddenly had Unix running on it. And it was a little workstation. They were selling $5,000 products. Even they couldn't beat the PC. See, we used to laugh, I, I will say, you know, here, here, here to Bill Gates, I guess. Cheers. Uh, uh, Bill Gates had the entire hardware side of his world beating their brains out to try to get cost out. Competitors of the vendors and the hardware. 
and he, he had the operating system. So <clears throat> I think we looked at that as a toy. And even to this day, you look at DOS, it was a toy compared to Unix. But um, yeah, the PC won, won those wars, and it continues to win them. Um, and that's just the way it, way it is. And, and, and the graphics accelerators are common. And even companies that NVIDIA competes with, obviously, that do the same thing, AMD. There's a number of companies that, that do. But um, it's, hard to, uh, uh, it's hard to construct what might have been. You know, it, it has oh. already. And, it, and I don't really much care. Um, I'm very grateful that, that this thing has all that kind of powerful graphics. So as it turned out, I got together with Mark. Oh, but you want to okay, back up? And then, well, the telecomputer. Yeah. Do you, did you yeah, have we, a question you wanted to ask? But. Well, you, actually, I was going to ask about putting this in the PC context. You already answered the question I didn't ask. And then all, um, the telecomputer, you were looking at all these, you know, the communications and all that. Do you want to talk about that before we get to? I, don't, I remember the term telecomputer, but I don't. It doesn't, well, it doesn't stick with and me. And this is from the, the Michael Lewis book, uh, The New New Thing. But he talked about you did a pretty major project to build the, the black box for the uh, interactive TV. Yeah. You had written a paper called The Telecomputer. Oh, that's you were right. Out, you were <coughs> outlining, you know, pretty much what we do now, but the you know, encyclopedias and books and shopping and banking and all this. Well, and, let's and, back up. I, I wasn't quite that visionary. Let's Let's... <laughs> what what, uh, what, <laughs> what we did at SGI in the, my last year or so was I kept, I had the idea that the network was going to be the cable system. Um, it, the internet per se in those days was the ARPANET. And... It was mutating into what we now know as the internet, but it, it, it was still kind of the ARPANET. It was used predominantly for email. And I wasn't that attuned to the internet per se, but I was attuned to the idea, and in fact I was promoting the idea that set-top boxes were going to be powerful computers that could play games and all sorts of things like that. They were going to be connected on a network. You could play network games. They were going to high-speed network. The cable system was the uh, had the capacity to carry digital network data. Honestly, I wasn't thinking of the internet, but it was it was the internet. It had the capacity to do all of the data transfer that you wouldn't use analog TV channels anymore. There would be data traveling over those channels. Uh, so I was thinking conversion from analog to digital uh, video and digital um, TVs. And sorry, I assume coming from a graphics background, the idea of you know, that had the bandwidth that you could have done serious graphics over the cable network. So I presume that was part of the interest. I mean, the internet, if you thought about it at all, it was way too slow to do the kinds of multimedia. Yeah, the internet was still, <clears throat> in those days, was um, slowed down by you know by by the way it worked, and and typically end users got access over a modem, not a cable modem, but a you know those things that made all the handshake, uh, yeah, that kind of stuff. Twelve hundred baud, you know, and that that, that wasn't even in my uh, thinking, but. High speed bandwidth, high bandwidth capability of the cable system was on my mind. And to some degree fiber. So I, I met with some people at Time Warner and uh, in fact, the guy that running Time Warner Cable now, I'm, I'm, uh, Glenn, um, I'll think of his name in a moment, but oh. um, 
But there were there were a group of people that I met with then. But Jim Chittix. Jim Chittix was the engineer, but okay. this guy was a manager. Uh, Glenn, um, I'll, I'll think of him. I think he's the president of Time Warner now, or Time Warner Cable. But in any event, um, I met with them, convinced them that we should do this thing, convinced SGI to work with them. I convinced Nintendo that they should build a 3D capability into their game boxes. We did a deal with Nintendo. We did a deal with Time Warner. Those are all my initiatives. You know, I was a prime mover of those. We built the Time Warner Cable Project in Orlando. It was an experimental thing with 5,000 homes, I think, where the set-top box was. Set-top boxes, right? Where yeah. are the... And um, that all got going, but that wasn't, and, and that's where my interest was. Networking via cable systems, games over networks, real-time interactive games, multiplayer games. That's how my head was working. So I did, oh. Go ahead. I was just gonna, when we finish, I wanna ask about your finishing of um, SGI, but are you going there? Are you still in this? Well, the, um, you had originally wanted to spin off a company to do that, but then SGI wanted to keep it in SGI, right? Mm, that may be. Okay. It wouldn't surprise me <laughs> that I wanted to do something like that. It also wouldn't surprise me to lose interest in it because SGI wanted to keep it. Um, I just eventually got very frustrated and uh, as much as any part of the reason was because Ed McCracken never had, he would just as soon I didn't exist by this time. He wanted to be the chairman, CEO, didn't want me, he would like me to stay on the board because it would be disruptive for me not to. And he and I were enemies. I just didn't like him and he didn't like me. Yeah, Lewis so, said he took your picture out of some, out of the annual report, or, I mean, it really got... I personal. don't know, I don't remember that, but I remember one time when we first hired him, I thought my daughter kept having trouble with his name, and she kept thinking of him as McMuffin. <laughs> and I just thought that was so funny. So I had his secretary, who was also <laughs> my, had her make up a nameplate, McMuffin, instead of McCracken. You know, one of those nameplates you slide into. Beautiful, yeah. 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 So one day we just slid it in and it sat there that way for a week. And suddenly it disappeared. And I asked her about it. She said, no, he never said anything to me. But um, so quite a few years later, we were in a, a, a major staff meeting and I brought this up. And people laughed until they saw him turn red. And then he said, you know, some people don't like it and you make fun of their names and everyone just thought, oh my God, come on, lighten up. But no, we didn't really get along. So when I finally, uh, I was to the point that I just couldn't, my wife told me, just leave and start a new company. You started one, you could start another and it kind of hit me <laughs> on the head. So how did that feel? I mean, this was your idea, this was your team, this was your... My whole life, to be life, honest with you. Right? Had it been invested in making this company. And didn't feel you, good. Yeah, but so what was I had the, lost all kinds of control. I didn't own more than about 2% of the company after 12 years. And um, probably Ed McCracken made more money than I did out of it. But... I just looked at that and I, I didn't like, it, it bothered me that Glenn Mueller was on the board and he knew it, knew the history and yet they didn't do anything to get me more stock, didn't do anything to help me out. So yeah, when I left, in fact, that's a part of Michael Lewis's book, Glenn wanted to invest in Netscape. And I said, Glenn, look, I'm gonna do this on my own. I'm gonna be the Series A investor I don't want any venture capitalists involved. And sorry, but I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to let you invest. And he, he, was, he was going through, he had some demons working in his head at the time. And eventually, uh, uh, unrelated to this, I'm quite sure, but 
he, he committed suicide, but he, um, it, was, it was hard on me. It was really hard on me because I felt guilty that I was partly responsible for that. But <clears throat> time went by and... Because you you've been good friends with him at one point, too. I had gone to stay at his house in Lake Tahoe. I had been skiing with him. Uh, you know, I was a single, a lot of those years I was a single parent. I'd taken my daughter with me to go skiing with him and his family. We were, we were friends and, you know, I never felt like heartfelt friends with him, but because he was kind of at a different station in life, he, he was an investor and I was just a mere engineer, entrepreneur. Investee. So, huh? Investee. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I, I did, you know, appreciate his friendship and uh, um, I always felt bad. Um, there are other st stories in there that I don't care to go into, but, but um, yeah, as a, then, then I, uh, I had had an experience with John Doerr. When I first came to Stanford, he had just left Intel and started work with Kleiner Perkins. And uh, John, he's an aggressive, tough little sales guy very smart guy. He, he's actually, he's the one that kind of carved uh, Martin Newell and I apart because Martin was willing to go off and do this work for this company in Chicago and I had a bitter, bigger vision. So I was a little resentful of John, but he, I, he was on the board of his son. He's, a, he's an aggressive guy and I knew him and I decided that he would be the investor I would like to have so in the Series B, I went to John Doerr. He jumped on the opportunity, and they came, and he helped build the management team at SCI, I mean, at, at uh, uh, Netscape. <clears throat> and he also helped recruit Jim Barksdale. So I give a lot of um, praise to John for helping build uh, the management team at, at uh, Netscape. And then I, I used, I, I started Healthy on, and I went back to Kleiner Perkins and got John on that board. And so, you know, I got a good long term relationship with John. There's, you mentioned that the lessons you had learned, so painfully, in terms of how you structured your, your relationship with your investors from SGI, uh, you would never repeat that again. Uh, so, you talk about the way that you structured uh, your investment with Kleiner and you being the you know primary investor for Series A and talk about the business side and then of course we want to mark well yeah, pass the, the, the kind Netscape of beginning of Netscape story. but while we're talking about John and Kleiner yeah well um, John wasn't really part of that thinking it was more I just felt like Mayfield Fund hadn't done the right thing by me and it may have just been something they either they didn't have the courage to do in support of me. Because let's face it, when you hire a CEO, his job is to run the company. And nominally, I was an employee working for him in some respects, but I was also the chairman. So it was always a real, and, and if he and I had worked like that, if Ed and I had worked like that, it would have been a different story. But Ed, Ed didn't work like that with anyone. Ed was party of one, he was in charge, very quiet, intense guy. And uh, not my kind of person, really. I, I, we just didn't get along. And, and so uh, I was resentful, and to some degree even with, with Dick Cramley, because he was on the board, but Dick and I remained friends. Uh, and I wouldn't let him invest either. He wasn't really asking to, but Dick, when I finally was leaving, and in, in the last year that I was at SGI, Dick and his partners offered me a general partnership at uh, NEA mm -hmm. for, for Peter Barris and a lot, of, a lot of really talented people. And I just looked at it. Dick gave me a long tutorial on what it means to be a venture capitalist, what the carried interest is and how um, it takes a long time to make any money because you're 
partnerships the last seven years and you're just one of the 10 partners and you might seeds. start making money maybe 10 million a year after ten, seven years. And I just said, I want to I want to knock it out of the park. I want to do something big and decided not to do that. But it was it was a big gamble for me because I didn't know anyone, didn't know anything to do. I had this fragment of idea about a network gaming company. And in fact, when I quit in the next I, that, that very day, I sent an email to Mark Andreessen. And Mark was sick of anything to do with Mosaic because, frankly, Larry, I think Larry Smarr, I don't really want to accuse him of it, but I think Larry was part of claiming the credit for Mosaic. And, it, and Mark resented it, rightfully. So uh, Mark didn't want anything to do with Mosaic. He didn't want anything to do with browsers, anything. I didn't want anything to do with SGI. So we said, what are we going to do? And we, we started talking to Nintendo. And they were willing to fund a network game activity. And that's what we were going to do. But as I looked at it closely, they were going to own more than half of it. And any corporation that owns more than half is going to make you do what they want to do. Neither of us wanted to be an employee of Nintendo. So uh, we backed away from that. And then... Mark actually had the idea. He said, uh, he said, look, all my friends are leaving, getting jobs. They're graduating. All the guys that work with me on this. And, you know, I didn't, I wasn't going to recruit any SCI people. So we were, we were going to target those guys. And he said, we better do something because they're going to all graduate. We and I said, well, what do you think we ought to do? He said, I don't know. Let's rewrite Mosaic and make it a, you know, see if we can make money on that. I said, okay. We flew out to. Wait, let's can we back up a mm -hmm. bit? Did, so it's Bill Foss that introduced you to to Mark. Is that who? Bill Foss. Yeah, Bill uh, Foss. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So he suggested you write to Mark, or or vice versa. And you were talking to Mark, not necessarily thinking of even doing something networking related. I mean, network games, no, but it's just I, I, you I, thought I, he was a bright guy and you were impressed with what he had done. It had nothing. To, I, call, I called him because he was a smart guy, I presumed, who was in a nominal job, having left, graduated, and he had a reputation of being really smart. So I called him. I sent him an email. And he responded 10 minutes later, and we met the next morning <clears throat> with nothing, no objective other than I wanted to start a company. I told him that in the email, and I, I couldn't recruit people from SGI, so that, would you like to talk about starting a company together? And what was that first conversation like? It was like any kind of exploratory conversation between two geeks. It was kind of a kind of um, something I didn't want to do, something he didn't want to do. Talking about what we might be able to do, and we embarked on this three-month period of of uh, three-month period of meeting at my house, drinking a bottle of wine, having dinner talking about what we wanted to do, talking through potentially doing a gaming network company. And then none of that panned out, as I, as I said, over a period of three months. Then it was April. That was January. And you were still thinking, according to, to Michael Lewis, you were still thinking of um, interactive TV in some form, right? Well, you mean according to Mike's book? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, we, it certainly had an influence. Remember, I had done Nintendo deal at SGI. I had done the Time Warner, the Time deal. Warner deal. They all kind of mixed together in the Meilu. It was sort of some kind of box <laughs> doing some kind of networking thing and some kind of gaming thing. Not very well defined. But probably involving hardware. It would have involved hardware. 
Uh, and then, like I say, that all kind of went up in smoke. We went out and started meeting with the guys and with the objective of hiring all of them and having a well-defined program to go execute on. The well-defined program really was rewrite Mosaic and do it in such a way that you don't even look at your old code. There's nothing patentable or at that time patented about a web browser. So I just said, just to be safe. Well, first I hired the guys. No, first I established that Mark was the leader. I had never met them. When I went out there with him, it became clear to me immediately that he was a leader. It's an important thing because if he had just been one of the team and they didn't want to follow him, but they were willing to follow him. And so I was kind of the elderly investor. Um, and I, I, at the end of our first meeting over beer and pizza, Mark and I met the next day and we just said, okay, how about this? And we gave diced up stock and agreed to put, I said, I'll buy half the company and that was it. And you knew Larry Smarr and probably Joseph Harden before that, right? I'd given I, Larry Smarr 30 workstations. Right. Because there was a room at a NCSA with your name on it. I mean, it, were you, you weren't involved with the cave, the, the VR stuff that no. you had. Uh, but there was a room, the Clark Room or something there. I have no idea. I don't recall that. But I gave them some workstations when I was at SGI. So that and initial investment came from your own money from SGI, is that right? You were, my or whatever. Limited you. net worth of, <laughs> of uh, I, I, I had about, um, say, 15 million of liquid, liquid net worth. I had house too, mm -hmm. but you know. And how much of that investment went into Netscape? Um, or Mosaic Communications, I guess it was called at the time. It was called Netscape Communications. Uh, it was Mosaic. called Mosaic Communications. Communications Corporation first, And I right? put in initially, uh, I, I think it was five. But, and we exploded. You know, we came back, the press just went crazy that I, A, had left SGI, B, had started this thing, in the same day, effectively, it seemed like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I think a lot of people at at at, Netsk at uh, 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 Silicon Graphics just assumed that I had this idea when I was there, but I didn't. It was Mark and I, and it, it, was, it was nothing but software, right? We weren't going to build any hardware, and we were just going to rewrite that and develop, um, you know. To be very, very frank, in the very early days, we didn't have any idea how we'd make money. And then we decided, in the process of structuring the language on the license agreement, we decided to make it um, free for individual use. But if, you, if your company used it, you had to talk to us about a license. So is it fair to say that it's one of the first instances of freemium? I don't know. I don't know if it is or not. Uh, it, it, it didn't seem, it didn't seem so, there was a little element of misdirection, I guess you could say, because you say, hey, it's free. But the fine print said, except if you're using it in your place of work, then your, your company has to take a license. And uh, trust me, there have been a lot bigger misdirection happened since okay. that. And I could even name one, very prominent one, but we won't go there right now. Um, the, um, it wasn't really misdirection, it was obvious. It was written in the licensing agreement, but it was in the fine print. Um, and people didn't read that when they downloaded it, including people who work at companies. So what happened is the companies discovered, suddenly their, all their employees were using this thing. They said, we better take a license. And uh, for literally for the first year, I don't even know, our sales department was taking orders. That's where, right, you didn't have enough phone people or something. 
And in the first year, we had 70 million in revenue off of a product that was nominally free. But, um, you know, one thing I'd like to make sure that the record understands is that we did kick off the dot-com bubble. Uh, and I think a lot of people thought we were a bubble, but we weren't. We had 75 million in revenues. And I believe profitable that first year. Uh, the next year it was 225 million in revenues. And the third year it was 500 million in revenues. And the fourth year, 700 million. So we weren't one of these, but what happened during that time is a lot of these companies, it, it was such a bubbly time that by the end of the 90s, you had a large number of people claiming to have a business, but they had no revenues and, or de minimis revenues. And, you know, I mean, when I've talked to, do you remember John Kohler? Yeah. Because I think it's him that told me that, but I mean, the comp some companies might have been surprised, but a lot of big corporations, they wanted to pay because they didn't want to use a free product and find that it was pulled the next day. And actually our uh, current CTO uh, at the museum comes from Cisco and he talked about wanting to do that contract with Netscape early on because a big company they wanted the full support. They wanted a guarantee to be there. So I, I think it was often in the interest of the company, right? Well, what a, it doesn't, you're, you're talking about a company's perspective, not using free product. A company wants a supported product. Right. And, um, you know, even Linux, as it became popular, Red Hat built a business just supporting it. So, but yeah. Um, it was important to to have um, for um, from our perspective it was important to have that clause in the in the licensing agreement and it yielded a huge amount of money now of course all of this skates around the central theme of those years which was that uh, I wanted, the University of Illinois had given the ability, had license, what, what was the deal? They would not license us, Mosaic. And we didn't want to use it. We just wanted to get the air, clean the air, clear the air that we weren't violating any intellectual property. So we offered to pay them a paid up license. And they wouldn't do it. This is before they spun, out, spun it off to Spyglass then. Spyglass was kind of in the middle of this. For, and this, Martin Newell, John Doerr were funding Spyglass. As, I may be getting things confused here. It's been a while, but, but in any event, I think, I, I think I'm confusing that with the company Martin went to, went to work for, who also had a license to some of the stuff we did at Stanford, it doesn't matter. The basic idea was that the University of Illinois in the form of Spyglass would not give us a paid up license. And in the exact same time frame, they gave Microsoft a paid up license. And I just felt, what, what an up yours from a university. First, they were angry I'd hired all the guys. And I said, you know what? Universities aren't supposed to be in business. They're in the business of education. I gave you guys a job, you know? And uh, you're trying to disable it. And they did. They tried to essentially put us out of business by not giving, I couldn't pay them. We had already a plan to give it away. I wasn't gonna give away 50 cents a copy or to pay to give it away. To pay right? to, yeah, yeah. pay to get the And I, that's why I wanted a paid up license. So I just finally decided, look, we didn't take your intellectual property. We didn't, didn't use it. And I hired a guy to do a forensic analysis of the software to prove to myself and to a judge that we didn't copy it. And then I sued them. 
So you sued them. I sued I, them. Okay. And I uh, didn't didn't serve. I filed it, but didn't serve it. It was filed in the state of California because I wanted that jurisdiction. But um, it, it sat there for 90 days. I kept expecting them to discover it somehow, but they were just oblivious to it. And my lawyer, at the time, I think he he felt that the right advice was just don't 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 serve it, don't serve the lawsuit because it's going to blow everything up. And meanwhile, <clears throat> we spilled. I, I spent 90 of the most anguished days of my life trying to reconcile their bad-mouthing us to all of our potential customers. And I was the CEO at this time, and I was struggling with that. And um, so finally, I, I, you know, the t we, you, if you file a lawsuit and don't serve it, you get a time limit, after which it's no longer filed. And I served it the day before wow. it was going to expire. In the next week, they had made peace because the university said, "We don't want to. We don't want to be interfering with our students." And it was, I, I, I apologize if, to you, Larry, if it's the wrong person, but I think Larry Smarr was involved in not allowing it to, allowing us to have a paid-up license. A bad mistake because, uh, you know. I'm a good example of someone who, who is generous to a university if they treat you right. Longer term, I ended up giving Stanford $150 million. And I think that is what the mistake the University of Illinois made is they, had they treated their students with respect and said, yeah, you go do that, pay, given a paid up license, at least the students, and, and not given, I mean, why wouldn't you give your students the intellectual property to go make money, or at least a license to it? Stanford did that to me in the form of the geometry engine. I got an exclusive license to the geometry engine. They not only wouldn't give us, a pay, wanted to pay us 50 cents a copy, but they gave a paid up license to Microsoft, which ended up enabling Microsoft to get off the dime more quickly. And so they effectively created our biggest competitor and tried to kill the company. So anyway, when, when, once I did sue them, the university, I don't think the university was knowledgeable about this stuff. It was Larry and that people that ran in, the people that ran Joseph in CSA. I haven't spoken to Larry Smart since, but I, I, he's a terrifically smart guy and a great guy. But that was a flaw if he was involved, if he was responsible for that. But that, um, you know, at the time we interviewed people, both a bunch of Netscape people uh, in California and then uh, all the people who were still at NCSA. None of them could talk about the settlement back then because they were under some sort of gag order. But now you can tell us. Can you tell us what what was the settlement, or do you remember? <laughs> I do remember, and I'm not going to tell you because I don't remember what the legal terms were. Okay. And but it, it was. It was yeah. But you did have to give the mosaic name back. I mean, that's why you changed to Netscape. <clears throat> but then. Yeah, that's, that's another example of picayunish behavior on their part. I mean, I don't care. I think Netscape's a better name anyway, but. But why not let the glory come to the university? They've tried to make the university a licensing, I mean, a very unfair licensing vehicle. I will say, SGI though, Stanford, you had a very good experience with that. Stanford was not as easy for certainly Google or Cisco. <laughs> I mean, no, I think, I think Google I think Stanford made out the way they did. They did, well. yeah. But they made it hard at the beginning. For um, I don't know. I'm just saying that you had a particularly, as spinoffs go, SGI was really smooth. For well, that. but in reality, we didn't even use the geometry engine. So it didn't, <laughs> they, they didn't, didn't hurt them at all. Um, and 
Look, John went on the board of Google, John Hennessy. Right, yes. yeah. Oh no, in the end it all worked out, but there was tension at the beginning where they, there was a bunch of IP tension about it. Um, there were no patents. No, now I, I did know a lot about this. Maybe, but, maybe yeah. there were, but you know what? It all worked out. I don't think, if there was tension, I'll bet, no, let me not comment about yeah. it. But the, um, and you bring up Microsoft, obviously. Um, the, well, to get back to your kind of, the business model, which at least the way I see this, you know, Netscape created, made the web possible as a, made it, made web commerce possible in many ways, because you found a way to make money off an open standard running over. Well, yeah, there, you, you're getting at something very dear to me now. Um, my latest company is doing something that stems from the security protocol we established Not then. The and the, what I knew with absolute certainty was that we could not be successful without making, first of all, there was no security protocol, no security system on the internet in those days. <clears throat> and I was intent on bringing commerce to the internet. But Mark had been working on, wasn't he working on the SHTTP for, for uh, Marty, for EIT? Could have been, but SHTTP is a different thing than SSL. SSL. What, what we wanted was from what we did is set up something that allowed you to guarantee you were talking to, here's, here's the crux of what SSL does. It establishes a secure link between two parties and it authenticates each party. So it's a, you know who you're talking to on both ends, and you're talking securely so that no one else can overhear you. Th that didn't exist then, although what did exist that I was familiar with was RSA, because uh, I had been, you know, as you know, principal investigator for DARPA. I had gone back and forth to MIT, met Ron Rivest. I met all these people. I knew them from my interactions as part of the DARPA community. and. Uh, that stuff had been invented since 1978. So there was no secret there. It was, it was patented and RSA technology, RSA security had taken that technology and started a company called RSA security. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, Jim Bidzos was running it. He, he's running the derivative of it now, the su successor of it now. But uh, Jim Bidzos, I met, worked up a license with RSA to use the technology in the process of creating SSL. And I drove, I, I told the guys, we got to create something for this. One of the few guys that came over and joined me from SGI was Kip Hickman. And Kip had been, and I still say, is one of the smartest guys I've ever known. He got us in the Unix workstation business back when we were trying to compete with the likes of Bill Joy and people like that. He, you know, Kip got SGI into the System 5 Unix business, ported it to 68,000, did all of that. But Kip also joined from uh, Silicon Graphics and I gave him the task of creating SSL or creating what became known as SSL. Kip is, was a very detailed hard, um, systems software guy. And he created the very first version of SSL, but in using RSA technology and invented a lot of the protocol, but it wasn't, it wasn't as robust as it needed to be. He wasn't a security guy. He had never studied under the traditional security folks. And he just picked up this stuff. And, and uh, Later, I was giving a talk somewhere and Tahir al Gamal was in the audience and I was talking about this and Tahir and I got together and I ended up hiring him, or we 
the company had hired Tahir, and Tahir got um, um, Paul Coker involved, another uh, Marty Hellman student. So these guys worked up the protocol. The, uh, what became known as SSL 1.3. Because the first one was the one that was cracked on the... Uh, there, were, there were problems with it, and I can't tell you right. the details of why, but it was, it was shown to have some flaws, so... But that was 1.0, and 1.0 1 .1 didn't, was... didn't even ever get released. Right. 1.1 1, 1 1 did, or 1.2, and then I... Uh, version three, one point, whatever you want to call it. That's when you hired those guys, and they really they created the protocol for the last version that became what largely we know today as TLS. Uh, also, just the politics of the situation, getting Microsoft to buy into it, and all of that. Um, we renamed it TLS, Transport Layer Security all their manner of stories as to why, but in my opinion, it's because SSL was created by, by Netscape and Microsoft wanted a, a new name. But uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, but um, in any event, we, 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 it was renamed as TLS um, 1.0. And then there was 1.1 and 1.2, which became for use for years, and then recently there's a 1.3, which adds some other unique um, aspects. But <clears throat> the irony of all of that is that we had a system, <laughs> it's just that, and, and there, I don't think this is a good place to get into the details of TLS, but basically TLS is widely used to secure websites, to, to authenticate websites. Right and secure the channel, but TLS was built with the ability to be asymmetric, okay, so that the user wasn't authenticated, ah. but the website was. So the user could be anonymous. It, the user is anonymous if you don't enable mutual TLS. So if you enable mutual TLS, the user has to have a certificate. The website has to have a certificate but it also has to be a certificate that comes from one of a group of accepted CAs, certificate authorities. So there's this forum called the CAB forum, certificate authority slash browser forum. And they determine who gets to be a CA that can be the root, right? So they, they can issue certs to websites and or organizations and the like. But in those days, um, and Tahir and I have been, Tahir recently, Tahir and Paul both got the Marconi Award recently and I was part of giving that to them. And uh, Tahir, um, you know, we, we were talking about passwords and he said, yeah, it's, 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 uh, we just looked at, there, no one wants to be a CA for users. And there are five, seven billion potential users out there. And in fact, maybe more because you might need a certificate per site you go to. So it's not a, a trivial task. And so we said, we punted and just said, let people use their name and let people use username and password. And that's literally the genesis of why we didn't force certificates on people. But part of the reason we didn't is the idea of getting a certificate authority to... to yeah, you would have had to set up or cause to be set up a huge yeah, yeah. infrastructure. Well, in any event, um, my, new, my current company is called Zero PW. And we'll get to the... Yeah. But, but the... Yeah, but it, it directly stemmed from right. that decision. And the importance at the time, though, is you couldn't do business of any kind over the web because there. Well, was yeah, no you know, every everyone in those days was worried about sending a credit card number over the internet, but frankly, it goes way beyond that. You know, um, 
Yeah, credit card number. You wanted a secret. You wanted a secure channel. Secure channel. I mean, this was, it, it was you don't important. use a party line on your phone, and you want to be able to have confidential conversations on the phone. You want to be able to have a conf a business absolutely requires a confidential conversation. Yeah, transact. And it's not just credit card numbers. It's every kind of secret technology you're talking about or whatnot. So you saw that as building basic infrastructure for If that. without it, you couldn't. We, without it, I was absolutely certain we wouldn't survive. We had to build commerce on the Internet. And the irony is that in those days, of course, the Internet was free in everyone's mind, and everyone thought we were going to ruin it. I was flamed beyond belief for called a lot of names. And I would just say, look, without this, you're not going to be able to rely on the government to provide this free to the whole world. The government has to get out of the business supporting the network. You're going to have to have businesses supporting it because that's the way the world works. And businesses are going to need to have secure exchange. So you, we, so it's going to get better. Just trust me. <laughs> that's what I would tell people. It'll get better, a lot better than the way it is now. It was slow because the government ran the backbone and you use modems and all this. But look, just having a place for business to be conducted changed the world and, and for the better. Definitely. At that point, did you also, you talked later about a platform, the web is a platform kind of against, let's say the, the Microsoft and uh, Windows as a platform. Were you already thinking in those terms early on? In an abstract way, I think, if you, if you step back, Microsoft pretty much controlled the world. You had to write to their APIs if you wanted to have any kind of commercial thing. And one of the things that the browser did was give you at least abstractly a single program through which you could go to many different websites, right? So even though at that time there were no APIs for writing stuff on top of the browser, uh, we promoted it as a new platform because we had to have a story. And part of that was marketing, but it was, it was a necessary thing. Um, We probably th threw a little too much sand in the eyes of Microsoft. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we weren't, both Mark and I, when we would give talks, would make jokes that Microsoft is the butt of. And I'm sure they didn't go down well with Bill Gates because he, he made it a, a, a point of trying to kill us. but. It would have happened whether we'd made jokes about him or not. We were threatening to him. But early on, you had reached out to them to potentially cooperate, right? Well, I don't know what you mean by that. We, I mean, that's in the, it's either the I think it's the new, new thing, but one of the books that. Right. Well, no. Uh, or maybe the. Uh, we, we would have enjoyed if they had licensed our browser, right. but they weren't interested in doing that. They were interested in taking over the browser. The, the irony in all of that is they took the ball, their eye off the ball, and Google came along and showed them where a bigger business, a, 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 big, a business as big as they would ever be. And um, no one was thinking of advertising in those days. It was all just where is this going? Let's, let's get a big piece of it. Yeah, and, and back to your business model. So, I mean, obviously the corporate license free to the user. You did think of a portal model later on. But we, how, were you, how were you planning to make money off Netscape specifically? As we did. But that, Charging, uh, but longer term, Microsoft is going to make that free, we knew. So you, you, you make money while you can and while the business model works and we created servers and created a number of different other products 
But it was, it was going to be tough, always. Microsoft was going to invade. Microsoft had tremendous throw weight in any startup. It's like trying to compete with Google. If you go directly at Google today, you're not going to win. Go directly at Microsoft, you're not going to win. This was obliquely instead of directly, but Microsoft decided they wanted it. As you know, Microsoft also decided they wanted the search business, but they didn't because Google had established the beachhead. And uh, yeah, so business is business, you know. you. It's, I, I like to say it's a legalized form of warfare. <laughs> and can you talk a little bit about Jim Barksdale, who you, you brought in? Um... Uh, Jim Barksdale, during the time that I was fighting this battle with, with the University of Illinois, hiring a sales force, building out um, I, I, I wanted, building out the, the, the team, I wanted desperately to not be in the position I was in. And it goes, it goes very deep beyond, I don't think I'm cut out for it. Um, companies, well, let's just say I wanted Barksdale really badly. So we began to recruit. We, we, we met him while he was still uh, COO of, AT of uh, Macaw Cellular. And they were getting acquired by AT&T. That was all kind of going forward. And he, he would talk to us, but he said, I'm not going to join you until we consummate this deal. And it's done. And he, but he, he said, yeah, I'm interested. So I made him an offer. And he, uh, the deal got done right at the end of the year of 94, I guess. Yeah, end of the year. And he joined us 1st of January after I had sued university, settled on that, gave them their little nominal amount. And, uh, That's, we shipped the product the first day he came to work. Yeah, December or something. No, he came to work in January. January oh, 1st. I thought you shipped, oh, you announced in 94. Yeah, we shipped, yeah. first shipment was January 1st, 1995, and we went public in August. And that was something he was not particularly keen on going public that early. Yeah, right? I think you, this was me, I, I, w I got, Larry, Larry uh, um, first of all, it was, it was a Frank Quattrone. And I got Larry Sonsini involved. And I had Frank come in and give a pitch. I think it was in June. And Frank was very positive about the prospect. We were a huge amount of publicity. We were making a lot of money. And... Uh, I don't remember the role Larry played, but he was supportive. I mean, he's a, he's a legal advisor he, and a great one. And um, so Frank had the board make this presentation and Barksdale was a little skeptical and then he said he wanted to think about it. And then over a period of time, he decided, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. I was keen because, look, I had spent all those years, I could see that I could make some money here, and I was keen to have liquidity. I was pretty broke. I'd spent all this money, my, all of my liquidity on SGI, really. I mean, on, um, uh, sorry, Netscape. Um, Netscape. And uh, I don't think I got a salary ever out of Netscape. So, we were, and, and, and once he agreed to do it, we started the machinery and we went public in August, even though people said you can't go public in August because everyone's on vacation. And it was a hugely successful IPO. 
And the um, spyglass had gone public. Was that that must have been part of your thinking as well, right? Or not? I'm not even aware. I hardly remember the name spyglass. They were not in my thinking. Okay. Not that I recall. Much bigger part of my thinking than my own wealth. <laughs> Talk about that road show, you know, to the IPO, and then that day. I mean, just in terms of pricing and the, you know what, you know what I happened? didn't go on the road show. You weren't involved in that. Not that I remember. Okay. How Let's about face it, Jim Barksdale was the CEO. Yeah. And and there's method behind my madness. I had spent 12 years as an officer of a public company, having my hands tied behind me behind my back. Forever, and I didn't really want to be a big part of this <clears throat> once it was public. I stayed with the company and I traveled a lot, went around the world. I was kind of the roving ambassador and I bought a plane at my own expense, never charged the company for any of that. I flew it around the world multiple times, taking marketing people. We went to Korea, we went to Seoul, South Korea. We went all these different places, Hong Kong, on my plane and I never built a company one because I was just trying to make the company worth more. And that was my role. And Mark and, and Barksdale began to run the company. They dealt with Microsoft, I didn't. Um, there was some kind of a deal being proposed with Microsoft that I don't think ever got done, but... Um, that they proposed to, what you don't remember? I don't know, is it, is it a deal going on between, look, I don't, I didn't care. I, I despised Microsoft. I didn't want anything to do with those meetings. I'm sure I would have not been the most gracious host. And, uh, Funny thing. <laughs> I just wasn't involved in any of the meetings on purpose. And then when we got acquired, I had no interest in being on the board of the acquiring company being any executive, any kind of role, because I knew that was golden handcuffs, you know? And it's one of the few, one of the, the wisest choices I ever made was once we were acquired, I backed away, and in 1999, I began to sell my stock. And I got it all sold by oh, wow. 2000. <laughs> before the perfect, perfect timing. <laughs> and so I, I made a lot of money that I, I made, I, I got out before the, the crash, and then... Wow, that made a big difference. Because I wasn't affiliated anymore. And the, the IPO itself, do you remember that day? I remember uh, uh, I had 20% of the company, and I could calculate here what the company's value was, but <clears throat> I know my net worth on the IPO day was Six hundred and sixty-three million dollars. <laughs> so multiply that times five, and that's what the so it was two and a half billion probably was what the company was worth. It's a great it day. A, huh? with, great day. Yeah. It was a unique decision, or tell me how unique it was to give. You gave quite a significant share to Mark, and then also to a lot of the engineers that came, certainly from NCSA, but also SGI, right? Yeah, I I uh, I think depending on whether Mark <clears throat> um, was able to sell at the right time, <clears throat> he should have made you know 150 200 million dollars. I would think. Um, I was able to hold mine. I didn't you know I gave some to my kids on the IPO, and they sold theirs. My mom held hers. Um, it went down to, from whatever, three, say three and a half billion mm -hmm. to being worth about a billion when AOL bought the company. <coughs> And then a year later, it was worth ten billion. If you had held on to your stock, you made ten x in one year. 
Uh, I know, because I held on to mine, but that, then I began to sell. I began to sell because I thought the market was crazy. The dot-com bubble. You weren't wrong. I was wrong. I was right. And, and I, yeah, I, I, I've never made money like that in real estate, but at least I made it there. Well, it was a different kind of an IPO because before then, the kind of mentality had been need to have consecutive quarters of revenue. And, and this was different kind of rules. Of the, it changed the rules of the game for going public, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, we didn't have a full year of revenues. And that was, uh, that was the part that was unusual. But we were a bona fide company. We had, and like I say, for four years, we had, got to almost a billion in revenues before we, uh, Microsoft really hit us hard. And then we were, we were going down in value pretty quickly. And, and uh, Steve Case, felt he, and he was right, he was able to buy us and it shot his stock up. But that decision, though, to do an IPO in such a unique way, um, I mean, you were, as you say, thinking more of your own wealth, but I mean, were you thinking of sort of breaking the whole model, changing the model of how IPOs happen? Yeah. I was just thinking of, to me, being public gives you a, a certain amount, certain image. If we had stayed private, I don't think we would have grown quite as well. Because it's a marketing, it, it's a marketing exercise too. You get, you become better known. You're publicly traded. The employees have now. You know, it's a, it's a relieving thing. I, I mean, I I've got an investment in a company called Palantir right now, which is. I tried to tell uh, Alex Carp, who's the CEO. I said, look, it's just not fair to your employees to stay private so long. How do they get liquidity? I mean, there's some pretty severe things happen when you. You offer stock options to someone, okay? They don't exercise them because they can't afford to buy them if you've already got value, right? So they sit on them. Time goes by, four years, they're all fully vested. They're tired of working here, they wanna go work somewhere else. They can't afford, if they're underwater, they can't afford, they don't, they, even though they're fully vested, they just walk away from them. Sure, and, yeah. and you're, those kinds of companies are doing a serious disservice to their employees. And it's one of the things I have a, such a hard time understanding. Peter Thiel is supposedly this great businessman, but that's a terrible business decision to keep that company private all these years, 14, 15, 16, 17 years. And, they, and I think they, they've just this is not serving myself at all here because I've got a substantial amount of money in that company, but how, if, if you, there's a, there's a certain um, coming of age, if you will, bar mitzvah, I don't know, you can call it what you want. There's a time for growing up. And part of growing up, you can remain private. You know, there are countless companies Warren Buffett buys a lot of those companies. There are countless companies, well-managed, that do stay private, but you don't do it by giving all your employees stock and telling them you're gonna get rich on stock. Uh, it, it's, it's just not fair. So um, we, had, we had a program like that, and I felt like it was a good coming-of-age story, uh, a marketing story. Tell, tell the world our story and become better known um, compete with the big guys. You know, you're grown up and you're out competing with the big guys. If we hadn't done that, I don't think anyone would ever. Chances are, um, AOL might never have bought the company. We no, we might never have made it. Again, well, it can't. certainly drew attention to web commerce in a way that nothing else could have. It kind of blew the lid off, really. Um, then suddenly, everyone is. Dog was a some kind of web-based company. Literally, <laughs> right? <laughs> but nobody knows on the internet. That's right. <laughs> in terms of the through lines of, of how you think about these other companies that you've invested in and started, maybe the details of, of Healthion and those others may not be as interesting to you, but 
from hearing you talk about they've been sort, it's of, sort of stepping it's stones in your journey of how you build companies, how right. you create values <coughs> and wealth, and your the role that you play right. as a financier and a vi you know technology vision person. I think there's a um, you know I'm on the board of my daughter's <coughs> school, private school. We recently recruited a new head of school, and one of the people we were recruiting was talking about <coughs> discipline and how she's ta she's uh, all girls, you know, high school age girls, and and. Uh, she mentioned expelling this girl. <clears throat> and it, re it made me reflect on my own experience of being expelled. And I know at least my perception of my state of mind then was I didn't feel like anyone cared. No one really was making any effort to understand me. And I was very confused in my own life. And I feel like. Um, and I, I recommended to her, I said, look, I try to take some time because sometimes it's just a, a child is confused and they, they're looking for some kind of a mentor or someone to give them good advice <clears throat> instead of a disciplinarian. Um, but it makes me think about a, a good deal of the drive that I, that I had came from wanting to prove myself, I guess. You know, starting to, feeling, starting to feel a sense of accomplishment, even in a, a school that wasn't hard. It was a class A electronic school in the Navy. And, you know, I was, I was with a bunch of other high school dropouts. I mean, how, but, <clears throat> little pieces of accomplishment, right, that give you more, in my experience, give you more drive, more motivation, and every little fragment. So I used to really strive to get those fragments. I wanted to get an A in this class, and that would encourage me to try to get an A in every other class. And you don't always make it, but you know, you, you try. At least not until I got in grad school did I start making it. But. Um, so, jump to Silicon Graphics. I started a company. It was, no one will doubt, no one would argue with the fact that I provided the graphics inspiration, the drive, the inspiration, the leadership to get the people. And over the years, it burned me out and I got so upset that I was perceived as a troublemaker in the company. And, um, and as I say, I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll take that accusation, but, but there was still that inspiration and drive going on in my head to get this thing to be successful for the long term. I didn't want something to go bankrupt. So, <clears throat> but when I left, I felt like, you know what, most, People just view me like everyone says about an entrepreneur. He was just lucky. And there's a tremendous amount of that. There is a lot of luck. So when Netscape blew the lid off and, it, you know, I struggled rich, all right, I was lucky twice. And I just wanted. I wanted to have another success. So I was thinking about the health problems I have. I have some genetic problems. <clears throat> they don't show up except in my blood. But and and when I first got that genetic testing done, um, I said, you know, and, I, and my desire to start healthy on was to try to remedy that. You know, you go into, you do it even today. You go in, you fill out the same piece of paper at every single doctor's office you go to. So I was so frustrated with that. I thought I was going to fix that. But uh, United Healthcare, 
bunch of these big monopolies, or not monopolies, in, install base of insurance companies. You know, they're not going to let you do that kind of stuff. They can keep you from it. And the CEO essentially told me that. He said, we're going to do that. I'm not going to buy it from you. <laughs> so <clears throat> there's a tremendous amount of, of that. There wasn't that. I just wanted to prove another success, to prove that I wasn't lucky. So it was a good deal of ego. Uh, you know, I don't have the big successful company that still exists. And I still have a desire to create something that has long-term sustaining value. Silicon Graphics was doing well, and then after I left it, they just, they just missed it, and it went down. Um, Netscape got the hell beat out of it by Microsoft. We got bought, I got out, but the company didn't really survive. And um, Healthion merged with WebMD, um, and it survived, but it's, it's not in great shakes. It's just a, a website. I don't have any. Uh, it does still survive, still exists. Shutterfly still exists. They're not like great and grand companies, but I got my a little bit of imprint on all of those. Um, I don't know, there's a, as, I, as I talk about it, drive is my keyword. Um, you, you've got to have a massive amount of drive. Either that or you're completely lucky, okay? I don't know, I wouldn't really, I mean, look at, Snap, okay, was Snapchat, you know, that, that, what's his name, I forget, the CEO of that, he's got a lot of drive, you can look at it and say it's a trivial little thing, but he does, he managed to survive, he's still managing to survive in the face of Facebook, and, you know, it takes massive drive to be successful in a company. The world is a competitive place. Someone's going to try to do, if you show success, someone's going to try to take it away from you. It's just natural. They're going to try to compete with you and do a better job or whatever. So it always takes a massive amount of drive. And I, that's the one thing I have. And I think I got it from the failure in high school. And, and you know, to kick, I mean, to be expelled from podunk, you know, nowhere <clears throat> by far the most successful person to ever come out of that little one horse town not saying a lot <clears throat> but um, jimmy dean he also came from plainview texas so there's a name people know um but but that that drive has to be there you, you're not gonna get something you know there's all there's all kinds of things that will happen that will discourage you and make you lose faith and want to stop and quit. And, I, and you can ask my partner, Tom Germelak, I've got drive. He's the best manager of people I've ever known. And so we make a great partnership because I, I have that entrepreneurial drive and he's my partner. So he, he gets to benefit from that. But then once it turns into something where he's in power, I get the benefit of his drive or his skill. What does that drive feel like to you? It feels like fear, anxiety. Um, a lot of it is, as it initially begins, that's the competitive, when you get to the competitive stage, fear, someone else is gonna beat you out of that idea or, or anxiety that someone's also doing this and maybe a better way. Uh, but the drive is something that's just compelling you. It, is, it has elements of fear and anxiety and vision and desire to see something different in the world. 
there's not an entrepreneur out there who's not trying to say this this is the way things could be and it's stupid that they're this way um, so that's a lot of being an entrepreneur I believe that is for me anyway and everyone's got their own story who knows ask Elon Musk I mean the guy he's one of the most brilliant market marketeers to hit the face of the planet you know but um, yeah that's I mean that's his singular strength but it's who knows what drives him but you, you know what drove Bill Gates or Zuckerberg all, all of the people uh, I I sort of know Larry, I know Larry Page and and uh, and um, Sergey, but they're driven by. He was driven by making search more pertinent, and it was more of a technology drive. A lot of my SGI stuff was a. I wanted to see graphics easier to use than Evans and Sutherland ever made it. Cheaper. I wanted it to be every man able to do it. I, I was successful. It's just that I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't the owner. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So it's a, it's a it's a complex mixture of things that include fear, anxiety, desire to see the world change, but cre but excitement too, right? I mean, some creative excitement. Well, excitement is. A side effect, but I don't think it's. At least for me, it wasn't. Yeah, it was a side effect of success. So many people who have had opportunities um, and have felt a drive when they've faced a really hard challenge or a dark time, it's been something that the, has sidetracked them. Can you think of a time that you would share that was a dark moment and how, what was it and how did you persist so that that drive could come out on the other end? Oh, I've got a, a doozy, but it's just personal life. You know, your personal life can collapse around you and your drive and your intensity can drive people away, loved ones. Mm -hmm. I fell into a bottomless pit for about two years when I was at Stanford, actually. Uh, because of a personal thing, and what got me out of that is, is I could have still wallowed around in, in the darkness, and and uh, probably had mental problems if I had. <clears throat> but I know I read, and I I discovered that you know I was the one that got myself in there, and only I was going to get myself out. And that was the realization, and what got what what makes I think people happy. Is productivity, you know, feeling like you're accomplishing something. You don't have to be making massive wealth. Feeling like when you go to work, you did something, you feel reward from that. I think that's what drives most people to be happy. You know, being that's what makes most people happy: being productive. So, uh, you know, you 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 can you can ruin that yourself by digging a hole. And crawling into it, so I don't, I don't, um, I don't know that there is one formula, but that combination of having nothing as a child, having to put myself through all of those years of school, change has always been good. I switched from electrical engineering to computer science to, uh, to physics. To computer science, to business, I thought I wanted to be an academic. You know, all of these changes open up new vistas. You know, you're, you're equipped with all of the things you bring from your other professional pursuits and academic pursuits, and they all make you who you are as you go into something new. And I, that's why I like variety. I like multiplicity. I like having, you know, it's like art. It gives me inspiration. Not because I want to be an artist. I just admire people who can execute on a vision. It's a pity, in a way. These days, entrepreneurs are worshipped to some degree, 
But if you look at the vast majority of the earth, we're, we're worshiping musicians. It's the creative people. It's the entertainers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the movie stars, you know, they get so much more recognition than the Joe Blow who goes in and has a lot of good ideas to help make a company. We get money if we're successful. They do too. The artists do. But watch TV. You don't ever hear, or, you know, okay, there's the occasional sitcom where, where, what's the one? I don't, I don't watch TV, so I can't really name it. Uh, it's, it's about physicists. What's the one where the, in any event, it doesn't matter. But, <clears throat> but people are, who are entertainers tend to be worshipped in our society. And the artists and the entertainers and so on. But there's those quiet little shy guys who are off working on some new idea that are actually changing the world. They actually like bringing out the commercial internet, which is what Mark and that team of guys and I helped do. And we've had a huge impact on the world. It hasn't resulted in enormous wealth in a surviving company, but we did. And uh, Bill Gates gets worship, a lot of worship. Everyone wants to know what he reads and he's pals with Warren Buffett and so on. God bless him, good on him, you know. He, he's a smart guy. He deserves everything he got. Not all of it was gotten with good behavior, <laughs> but <laughs> he deserves it because he won. Um, you know, not everything is just. Business is warfare. It really is. You, you, you even you say, I want to, you're trying to kill the competition. You are. You really want to put them out of business. Larry, ask Larry Ellison what that's like. <laughs> he knows. He dominated databases because he's that kind of personality. I wasn't quite as ruthless, but I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> When you look at the valley, kind of in the broad sweep, you came at a time that was so early in, in the valley as a place for both innovation and entrepreneurship. How would you characterize it and its role in the world, kind of its impact, and particularly the kind of inflection points that you were a part of because you've been, you've been a part of that for so long? The big two inflection points for me were turning graphics into something that's every day, being part of that. I, you know, look, Ivan, all kinds of people were my mentors, but yeah, I was part of it. And then being able to see that the internet could be much bigger, it, it's almost like it was gonna happen. Mark did Mosaic before I ever came along, but the combination of us got together and made it business. Made commerce work, made the internet work, and um, <clears throat> paved, paved, laid, laid the first few bricks in the road for the Googles and the Amazons and so on. So um, the inflection points that I feel most, I don't use the word proud, but I feel really good about. And I think if you talk to John Hennessy he would uh, corroborate this to some degree. But when I had made a lot of money and I kind of wanted to go, <coughs> excuse me, I wanted to go to Stanford and become a biologist. I was kind of over computer science, made a lot of money, and I thought I want to do something in biology. And he took me around. He was provost. He took me around, maybe, maybe he was head of engineering at that time, but I think he was the provost. And he took me around to meet all these biologists and see what they were doing. And I was just overwhelmed. I thought, whoa, I'm never going to be able to get caught up enough to do anything new in this field. So I went away after that and I was thinking, I don't know if I, I <laughs> it's a lot of work. I was already at 50. And it, he, I just thought, this is not going to work for me. <coughs> so, I had, no, this is probably before I was 50, because I'm 75 now. 
But he said, uh, I, I said, I went and talked to him one day, and I said, look, I, I think I was, I was thinking maybe start my own research place, research lab, but I'm going to have to compete with Stanford for all of the talent and everything. I said, I think I'd better off giving you a bunch of money. And so we started thinking about that. And they were, unbeknownst to me, already doing some work on the uh, BioX activity. So I provided the funding for that. And I think that'll be one of the most significant things that I've done uh, outside of, of Netscape. Netscape was significant in the way it affected the world, but this is going to have an impact too. And that was out of just gift, generosity. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad I, I did that. I'm glad I had a part in that. I'm glad I, even though I could never have been admitted to Stanford, I couldn't afford to go there. I'm glad I had a chance to be there, which is another reason I gave them the money because somehow Forrest, a combination of people enabled me to be successful once I stepped in the boundaries of Stanford. And so I thought, well, I'm going to donate something back. And John will tell you, I mean, he was provost when I did that. He got promoted to, to, to president. It was the biggest gift to Stanford outside of the founding grant in those days. And, uh, and then John and his talent managed to convince all these other people in the Valley. Just, he, he raised more money than anyone's ever raised for Stanford. It's in the many billions. So I think I played a little role in getting that started, and I'm glad for that. Um, those are, that is a big transition in the Valley. I don't, the way the Valley is today have become so expensive to live, to be dominated by a couple or three companies. There's still a lot of smaller companies, but those two, those two or three behemoths, uh, I guess it's good. Um, you need, there's got to be enough room for little guys to not get stepped on to grow. Dramatic innovation, I'm pretty convinced, is not going to come from the Googles, not going to come from the Apples. Apple's a great company. I love their products. I use them. And they, they, they're quite innovative, but I'm talking about the revolutionary changes those will be created by some people who get together and decide they're going to make a difference. I, I don't think it'll be, they may have worked at one point for Google and learned some things there, but so you need that thriving startup atmosphere. I think it exists now in New York to some degree, certainly as much as out there. And the irony is that here, here in New York, um, you can hire people and they're not always worried about how much they're going to own in the company. Out there, you, you won't find anyone starting in a company who says, show me the stock. And I'm, I'm the kind of person I'm going to give stock whether you ask for it or not, because I believe people deserve to own part of the company. But I'm not having to fight that battle in recruiting out here. So it's a different recruiting environment. There are just as many smart people, a little less of the type of, there, there's some keys about a startup. One is, <clears throat> I like to think of it, you, got, it you, you have the infrastructure for financing, but most important is the infrastructure for management. A culture that allows people to move and, you know, they, they've gotten their, they've cut their teeth on a some company and, and I don't like the, employees that had jump, 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 always to get the better job, but those who've spent some measurable time, significant time, helping make a company successful, those are the kind of people you want to manage your startup. That is not so true out here. So the management structures, you have to bring them in from Boston, DC, it's, and, and the people here, it's mostly finance, right? So it's not, but people will move. New York's not a bad place to live. In California, you know, it's just as expensive as here now. 
And uh, I think it's got all the problems you've got here with inequity of housing and all that, but I think this is to some degree more vital. I like it better than, than California for, for starting a company. You've also been an investor in so many companies. You mentioned a few of them, Shutterfly and others. When you're evaluating the, the team or the idea that you're investing in, what do you look for? Oh boy, that, <coughs> excuse me, that's a tough one. You know, <coughs> the fact is um, you invest in teams of people instead of ideas. Ideas form the basis pulling a first team together, but I don't know many people who invest in the idea. And the mistakes I've made is to think the idea was central. <laughs> You're, the much more central importance is the, the team, and that's where you have the highest likelihood of failure. When, I mean, I've got, I don't want to mention the company, but there's a company now that one of the other investors, there are three kind of equal investors, three equal board seats, right? And the, and the management of the company has three board seats. So there's six, it's kind of, and there's one of the investors that think that they should have some kind of special say. And they, you know, you just want to tell them, look, the guy's quite young. And I, I sometimes just want to say, look, you know, I didn't start this game yesterday. I know what I'm doing. And likewise, my, my friend TJ is on the board, and um, it's it's just amazing how bad some investors are, truly bad. So that's one way you can go wrong, get a bad investor. But the management, in this particular case, the the man this investor tried to carve the CEO away and come have a visit, without telling the CEO. <clears throat> That's how bad he is. So, and, but but there was a little discord on the management team too. So it, it, companies are really delicate things. You've got to get a group of people who are working hard together, common objectives, no talking behind people's back. Everything is out in the open uh, as a management team. And, and then you have a hope, you know, of getting a company going. But it's it, it, all of my mistakes have been not doing enough due diligence on the people or thinking too highly of myself <laughs> or um, wrong market, but that's, you can, that, that's usually a function of the management. If the management are smart, they're gonna be in a good market, have thought that out. I, am, I, don't, I won't claim to be very successful in any of those. I've made, five successful investments, not counting Silicon Graphics and Netscape. Well, Netscape was actual investment, but I, was, I think I've been wrong. My CFO was a great, great example. That was a, a company that I found once I was wealthy, I needed someone to help take care of my bills. I needed a family office, what I didn't know. <clears throat> at the time, so I got my friend Harvey Armstrong, who was my accountant, and he said, you know, I could do this for 10 different families. And I said, well, why don't we start a business that does that? <sighs> Unfortunately, the CEO we had wanted the company to offer tax products. Now, tax products here are put in quotes because they were created by accounting firms, but they had to do with avoiding taxes. And I, I remember having calling a meeting, I said, guys, I don't think we ought to be doing this because if it ever gets disallowed, our business will just go away. And I won't buy one of these tax products because I think it's dodgy, even though it fits the letter of the law. Let's make sure we're doing stuff that hits the spirit of the law as well. <clears throat> uh, CEO wanted to do it. Board went along with it. We started doing them. Two years later, 
Anderson Consulting, all of these things just blew up in our face. And we couldn't offer these tax products anymore. Half our revenue was coming from them. You know what happens when you lose half your revenue? You lose your company. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's an example of it's just bad. I won't call it governance because I got respect for all the people. I don't want to mention who the board was, but it it was it was not a good thing to do. And it was because you could just it didn't feel right to do it. It was technically legal, but it got illegal. It became illegal a couple of years later. And you could have guessed that would happen. I did. But so there's a lot of ways you can fail. And that's why most companies fail. So I, I, I'm lucky to have had you know, maybe half my companies I've been involved with have at least been successful. And, and two have been big. But I, I, don't, I don't go into them lightly, but it, it's hard to make a big success. It's really hard. That's why I take my hat off to all of these people I mean, that have done it and sustained it. Look at Google. I mean, Google's a funny one. It would have, they started out giving away search for free. It wasn't a sustainable business model. There was no business model until someone said, well, suppose we sell the top two positions in a, in a that people bid for the top two positions as an advertisement. It's no longer doing what they were doing. They're not offering the best search. So I always look past those top two and click on the third one. <laughs> okay. So I'm not paying clickbait for, you know. But still, what other company has revolutionized your ability to get access to quality information, like Google. You, I mean, I know they are the best search engine. Uh, even, and I know that those top two, and I know to work around the ads myself, but uh, I still use them. I don't use, you know, Gmail. I don't use a lot of these other little bait to get you hooked into Google, but I do use search, and I would pay for it. <clears throat> I'd rather pay for it than have ads stuck in my face. <laughs> in terms of you as a serial entrepreneur, bring us up to date with Commandscape and what you're working on today. What are the ideas behind those, and what was the germination for those companies? There's nothing very significant about Commandscape other than I had <coughs> I had a big house, <clears throat> and I wanted to be able to control it. The lighting, the security, all aspects of my home, access into the home. And so, as a hobby, I just worked on this stuff. This is during my re retirement years, starting uh, when I was about 60. I just kind of retired. and worked on boat control software and um, home control software. And it never was destined to be super big. What, what I did want to do though, which is going to be a big deal, I think, whether for me or it will be a big deal, uh, is I made it so that, because, you know, at Netscape we created uh, SSL, TLS, whatever you want to call it. It's what secures your connection to the website. It's what gives you proof that you're talking to the website. It all happens automatically for you. <clears throat> but back in 95 when we did this, even though we could give the user a certificate that guaranteed, allowed him to prove who he was, it was just too much of a hassle. And we were trying to get too much done. And so we just said, we're going to make it optional whether the user uses a public key certificate and let them use username and password. And never thought about it again for years until passwords just started 
haunting all of us. And uh, so this little commandscape company, the first thing I did was say, we're going to use SSL to make sure that you're talking. I don't want to ever have to enter a password. And we did that. And then um, it still required all of the old infrastructure, certificate authority. We created all of that, made it available. And it's still offered as part of what the company does. But then the two guys who worked most heavily on that wanted to go do it as a broader thing for everyone to have a way of eliminating passwords. So we did that and they invented some very clever things that make public key certificates usable by ordinary people. So um, applied for patents on that and it's now I'm now recruiting heavily here in New York to staff that company and and sell it to the broad market. And we have one big customer who has 150,000 employees. It's a big partner. I don't want to say it here, but it's it's a good company. And um, um, that's kind of our first customer. And we're going to sell it to millions. Can you talk about how you solved the having ordinary people use certificates? Or is that part of the secret? For, suffice it to say that ordinary person can now have their own certificate and they can prove that they're the owner of it and they can present it to a site and prove that they own it and it's based on TLS. So they become their own authority in a sense. It's just I don't want to go into it here because it's still kind of trade secrets until we're in the market and making hay so to speak. So. But from the user's point of view, easy and transparent. From the user's point of view, it's no, no more difficult than using a password. Which, by the way, is what you've got to do. You've got to compete with the ease of use of a password. True. Yeah. Otherwise, people won't use it. And if you can say, by the way, you don't have to remember this. It's automatic and it can't be broken. Lots of companies are interested in that because huge amount of fraud from password account takeover. I think I read McDonald's has half a percent of their revenue is lost to account takeover. You know, and that's just in that market. And there's many, many, many markets it applies to. It's, the entire world uses password, not all of the world, 99999 percent of the world use passwords and we would like to make that a low number, but it, you got to do it in stages. You got to the most effective ways. There, there are effective ways to go at it. And so I don't want to be talking about the new company strategy, but it is, it is dedicated to eliminating passwords altogether. And it came out of Commandscape. It, the inspiration for it, began at Commandscape. I forced Commandscape to have no passwords, <clears throat> and we did, but we did it using traditional route. Then we left, and after some more independent thinking, we came upon these new ideas and patented them. So it wasn't really, it didn't really come out of Commandscape, but that was sort of the genesis place where we were first trying it. So, but it, you know, it's like everything else, it might <laughs> fall on its face. No guarantees in life. <laughs> <clears throat> You've talked about how your different visions for technology have become real and served markets and customers. You've also talked a bit about how you learned from uh, early on and a first time entrepreneur nothing about finance and then became much more wise about how you interact with venture capital and subsequently you've been able to use your own funding for investments. Do you want to talk about how you have evolved your approach to financing for entrepreneurs? You know, I, I, I venture that most entrepreneurs are at least street smart. Um, I was pretty dumb business-wise, truly. I mean, to give half the company for $400,000 or 800000 I guess, 
Um, I could have gotten a better deal if I had not been so impatient and so on. But you got to start somewhere, and I started there. And I can't look back. Look, all along the way, you learn things about finance. You learn what you learn everything that you know that I mean from what's preferred stock common stock you know what is the value or the ratio of common stocks value to preferred stock why is it called preferred uh, market capitalization financing road shows there's just all of these it's a, it's a a wilderness of things you go through and you come out knowing You've learned something, and so that, that's just learning by doing. And um, so, yeah, I've got a huge amount of knowledge learned that way, not formally acquired, not by going to business school. I have a, I have a respect for people who go to business school, business school, but I don't respect people who come out of business school and think they can now, you know, think they're they're. Um, God's gift of venture capital, how they know more. You know, I've, I've found a lot of them. I mentioned one a moment ago who thinks he's got all these skills. He doesn't. I mean, he's, and you know, what, how do you how do you control people like that? You just, they just have to learn on their own. Eventually, they realize I'm not getting anywhere with this approach. You carve them off, and you you just ignore them. That's what you do if you. <laughs> You just say, okay, okay, yeah, you sit over there and rattle and we'll get our business done here. And, uh, but, you know, you, a lot of it, you, you can learn. That's what business school is about to some degree. You study finance, you study business cases and so on. But the world is built of people with multiple talents, different talents. You know, some people are good at managing. Some are good at ideas, some are good at finance, some are good at marketing. And you, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's why business schools and companies would much prefer someone go do some work somewhere in between having, the, you know, develop a real sense for business. There's countless Harvard, Stanford, Yale, MBAs who come out and think they you know, they, and I, I had a few of these on, on boards. I was on boards with people who were fresh out of business school, rarely, but they'd usually come in with a more senior partner. And uh, there, there's a lot to be said for experience, but there's a lot to be said for education. So it's just, <clears throat> no matter how you start it, try to value all of it in some way. You know, you're not... It's rare to have someone who totally gets the whole picture. I, I, I mean, if, if Bill Gates had gotten the whole picture, he would have invented Lotus One, Two, Three. Uh, you know what I mean? There's, there's, there's also just business is cutthroat. He was cutthroat. He said we ought to build that ourselves. Put Lotus One, Two, Three. Put Lotus Development Corporation out of business. Put Netscape out of business. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it truly is cutthroat. And um, yeah, you, yeah, I don't know what else to say. I have a couple more questions. Mark, do you, as we're coming on the last bit here, do you have anything else that you'd like to ask at this point? Well, related to the investment, but <coughs> maybe too specific, but do you consider um, uh, what you did with at home? Was that an investment? Was it? Would you consider it one of your companies? Is no, no, no. That was. I wasn't involved there. At home was. Was TJ. Um, I never actually made any investment in at home. Okay. I think. TJ. Uh, in my opinion. The board member from AT and T had controlling interests in at home. Ultimately, eventually, and that board member was terrible, and he ruined the 
prospects for the company. He certainly didn't allow them to blossom. And, and I think he was not thinking on behalf of all shareholders, but he was worried about AT&T's interest and his own personal interest. And that's a, the problem with getting corporate investors in a company. They have a different set of objectives. Their objectives are their own corporation. They put some money into you, and there's some ulterior motive normally. Um, if you're lucky, their ulterior motive is to make money and not have you be part of them. And so they're looking for the same exit as a, as a venture investor would be, or as employees are looking for it. Reward. But, but then the merger with Excite made it, I mean, it worked out to some extent. Say again? Well, the, with Excite, there, it became, uh, I mean, they both got value from that. I don't know. Okay. I don't, as at-home networks exist? Hmm. I don't no. think so. <laughs> um, and then the, we didn't talk really about Halcyon at all. Should we go through the basics of it? <coughs> well, I think he kind of indicated that. Yeah, I, look, maybe we can Halcyon was, started out as a desire to simplify enrolling in your health plan or enrolling, going, <laughs> even today, look, you ought to be able to carry something that has your identity on it and go in and stick it in something and not fill out a whole bunch of paperwork. You should have your medical records, all of that. Why in God's earth isn't that the case today? So that's what I wanted to originally do. And I, I recruited a bunch of Indians who used to work from for Silicon Graphics because I was friends with them. They had missed out on Netscape. And they worked really hard on trying to put some meat on those bones. But it eventually turned into kind of clearing, a clearing, kind of like credit card clearing, billing and clearing. I mean, it, it, we, you, you adapt to what you got to do. And at home, uh, obviously, I mean, not at home. Um, uh, uh, Healthion merged with WebMD and a fellow named Marty Wygod kind of took over as the CEO eventually. And 2008, when the market blew apart, I sold all my Healthion WebMD stock. I wasn't on the board anymore. So I lost interest. They continue to exist. They run a website. You can go there and find out Healthcare information, and I'm sure they make money advertising like most websites. At the time, Healthion went through that boom time. You had investment from I, I think um, NEA and Kleiner, and it its valuation, its market valuation did shoot no, at up. At one point, I had you know. <laughs> at one point, I had probably a billion dollars in Healthion stock, WebMD stock. You know what I got out of it? 60 million. <laughs> <laughs> but the distinction still was, I, th I think, that you and I were... had 30 million in it, so it's not like... <laughs> the 2x isn't <laughs> bad. <laughs> but, you know, I, th I think you were the, f the first entrepreneur to have $3 billion valuations, though. Is that right, if you were to count this? Yeah, you know, that's what Michael Lewis said. I, I never said. really... Do you think about it that way? I or? don't know. Yeah. You need something to sell books, you know? Well, I was just curious how you... You know, people write about their views, but really, what really matters is how do you measure your success, you know? Um, I'm glad I had one good financial success. <laughs> it does make a difference in life, but um, yeah, I got, I got uh, I, no complaints financially. But um, yeah, as, as anyone to tell you has made money, it, uh, it's not the, the end all of everything. I much, much prefer having a happy home life with happy children and, you know, it's, it, those are the sorts of things. And being respected, thinking 
respected intellectually as an academic, as a thought leader of some kind. Those are the things that matter more to me than another success. But there is a part of me that's driven and that drive continues and I can't even explain it. Why do I give a hoot that people use passwords? It just bothers the devil out of me. You know, I just hate it. It's the most irritating thing in life, passwords. And I feel partially responsible for that. And so I just want to improve it. And I don't want to do it for free. <laughs> So there's a business element in there, but I just am. So look, I'm 75. I by the time I'm 85, I'm not going to be thinking like this. But I still have, you know, some drive. I, I get tired more easily. <laughs> but it's it's a it's a drive, and that's about all I can. It's 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 kind of the the force that pushes you along in life. You're almost it's reminding me a little bit. Uh, Sandy Lerner told me that she didn't do anything because, s sort of, for its own sake, it was to solve a problem, like something that bothered her. I mean, does it feel like that to you? Every it's, entrepreneur is solving some problem that's bothering them. But it irritates them that it yeah. can't be. You, you want know. to change it? This is absurd. It shouldn't be like that. <laughs> You've had other areas of your life that you've been world class in art, in uh, real estate, in uh, in would, sailing. I don't know. Would you? Oh, sailing! You, yeah, I've done. You want to talk about sailing? We haven't talked about sailing. Yeah, yeah. We can't miss this. Yeah, it's, I've I've gone through the sailing thing. Oh yeah. <laughs> Fifteen years is enough. I I I first had a small boat. Forrest Basket got me in. Yeah, yeah he got you. He, he showed me his little 35-foot Baltic, and I thought, well, I'd like to have something like that. But it, it seemed a little small. He used it to sail around the bay. So I bought a bigger, you know, 55-foot Baltic, and I sailed that for a couple of years, and then I, I need a bigger boat. And then I got this 95-foot yogurt, big, heavy steel thing, and I went in the South Pacific with that, and I came back, and I said, I just, I saw uh, Bruce Cates had a boat called Juliet, and I saw that, and I said, that's a beautiful boat. I want to build one of those by the same company. So I hired the company and built his boat. I built a bigger boat, 155 feet. Shortly Hyperion? after that was launched, <laughs> Netscape went public, and I thought, wow, i got to build a bigger boat. <laughs> and I built a 300-foot boat. I finally overdid it, and so I held that for a long time. And I finally sold that to a well-known person that I'm not going to tell you, <clears throat> a very, very well-known guy, and he loves it. He's, he's a designer. He has great taste. And uh, I just got the beautiful letter from him the other day talking. He's a very eloquent guy. And he was j just so glowing about the boat and how much he loved it, how much he appreciated the amount of energy that went into the engineering and design and all of that. And he says, it's still as beautiful as ever. And I was thinking, now, I did something. This guy is complimenting that. So, uh, but then I built a racing boat. A hundred foot, super lightweight record setter. And I went around and rec broke the Sydney Hobart record. I broke, broke all these different records around the world. And then I, a couple of years later, I sold that because it was costing too much money to race. It required 20 crew having to fly around the world do all these races, and that's expensive, so I got tired of that. Now I own a simple copy of Endeavor 2, a J-Class uh, racing boat, but it's from the 1930s. It's a gorgeous, ele elegant looking boat, and <clears throat> I can't take a bunch of people on it because it's not big enough, so I take my family and my daughters, and we have a good time, and that's my only boat. <laughs> it's, it's nice to have been through that, but I've wasted more money on boats than <laughs> most people ever hoped to make. And it just, I look at it and say, we had a lot of fun. I went around the world a couple of times. I dived in every possible place. Okay. So I, you know, so I get dead going for me, I guess. <laughs> No, I, I, I love boats, but I'm tired of, 
Hey, it's just the expense of owning. It, I suppose <clears throat> if 2008 hadn't happened, I, I would probably still own it. Because it's, it's a, f but, but the other thing is I have two children now and I can't use it like I, I did when I was going around the world. We were using it one month a year. And it's an expensive month. And it's an expensive headache because there's 20 employees, highly well paid, Special all the right. maintenance and the headache. And I didn't charter it maybe twice. Charted it once to, to uh, I don't know if I had to go into this or not. A fellow well-known New Yorker. And um, he had a boat similar, kind of similar, but his caught on fire. So chartered it to him that particular summer for a month. And he spilled coffee or tea on the rug in the living room. He fell, he went to sleep and he woke up and his tea was sitting on the floor, right? He woke up and didn't even think about it, put his feet on the floor and knocked over a cup of tea. He wouldn't pay for it. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> after chartering the boat. And I just thought, this guy is one of those kinds of people, you know? I would love to say his name because he's such a jerk, but I'm not going to. <laughs> Your decision. <laughs> We've talked about people that have been influential. We've talked about, you've mentioned people that you've admired, uh, and maybe some of the people that mean most to you. Do you want to add any, um, anybody to that list? Any stories that we haven't told about some of those relationships oh, that are really important to you? You, John Hennessy, look, I mean, what a guy be an office partner and then he goes on to best, arguably the best president of Sanford ever. <clears throat> Forrest Basket, one of the smartest people I've ever met. He's just a, a terrific guy. He's, he's a little bit older than me and a, a, a phenomenally nice, soft-spoken, brilliant guy. Um, Jim Barksdale, I love that guy. He's, he's just an all-around good man, full of aphorisms, like, you know, you, oh God, I, I can't even think of him right now, but he, he's got so many little Southern sayings, you know. But, um, yeah, um, TJ, my, my partner, great guy. There's just so many people, Ivan Sutherland, Chuck Seitz, people that, even my physics professor back when I was in LSU. Um, Charles, uh, uh, God, I've forgotten his last name right now. But he was, you know, you go through your life and there's certain people that kind of change it. He was just a professor, but it is his style. His last name. He's going to be. But, um, and then Ivan and Dave Evans and those guys that I, you know, there's these sort of waypoints in life, you know. that Those are real waypoints where <clears throat> they made a difference to the way I think, the way I. Am you know kind of like they, they enlightened me in some way, or imparted some of their enlightenment. I won't say I'm enlightened, but you know I got some a little bit of glow from being around them. And um, um, and I try to do. I try to be 
good to people. I don't think. Yeah, I'm not as ruthless as a lot of businessmen. And I will give away a little more just to keep peace. I'm not terribly selfish when it comes to that. Um, I still respect these other people that are. But I think, I think you kind of get, like Jim Barksell used to say, you get more with honey than you get with vinegar. Uh, <laughs> honey draws flies. You say that. Draws flies. When, yeah, when, <laughs> talking about competition, yeah, honey draws flies. <laughs> <laughs> Are there sayings that people would be quoting? Well, Jim used to say, are there things that are there Nothing I made up. It's all stuff I've stolen from someone else. Because <laughs> I use a lot of Jim Barksdale's uh, in the situation will present itself and you'll find yourself saying something that he used to say. I liked He's your, a, huh? I liked your Elliot quote. but then. That one I picked up just from reading. Uh, that, that came from, you know, I told you the time I dove into a hole emotional hole. Mm -hmm. I was reading everything to get out of that hole and that was, you know, poetry sometimes works. But T.S. Eliot was, was talking about emotional breakdown and love and things like that. And that, but it's such a nice uh, reminder not a whole lot of point in dwelling on the past. You know, it is here, it's here now, make use of it. And that probably the biggest thing that I learned in life, I'll think about the past, I'll try to figure out what went wrong, but just so that I can learn from it, is not to drag it around and beat people over the head with it, or myself. But it, it, I, one of the biggest lessons in life is just live in the here and now and get on with it. Because you're not going to be able to change that, just, you know. But uh, what else? No, I would just honestly tell people if they, if they really want to achieve something, it takes a lot of work. You really have to work at it. It doesn't, no, I, don't, I don't know. There, we all know and have encountered people in life that you would guess everything came to them effortlessly just because you think, oh, wow, that person is smart. Well, I'm not that way. I know that. Everything I got took a lot of effort. <laughs> so I guess that means I'm not brilliant, but I do. I mean, I, I work hard. I really am one of the most driven. You know, drive is my key word. Um, I'm one of the most driven people, and I, can't, I cannot identify why other than my own set of reasons that I've already gone through. Um, you get, you get a, a, a lot of drive trying to get out of Texas. <laughs> it took a lot, a lot to get out of Plainview, <laughs> you and Jimmy Dean. <laughs> when you think about Dylan and Harper, I believe your, your daughters, and you envision the way that they're going to draw from your strengths, what you've given them. Are there anything? Is there anything else that you'd like to add to the story for that generation or the next generation of Well, the first museum? of all, I've got a two two grown children mm -hmm. and grandchildren by them, and they were a victim of, the, of what I was going through. I mean, I was <clears throat> I was in school the whole time they were growing up, mm -hmm. and then. For all practical purposes, the first four years of being out of school, I was still in school because I was teaching. And uh, so they grew up without me. So one of the things that, but, but we're all still really close and they're uh, part of my family. My daughter, grown daughter, did very well. She was married to the founder of YouTube, Chad Hurley. And uh, they, she got half of what they owned when they split up. So she's independently pretty wealthy and my son is one of the founders of this new company with me so I'm trying to help him become wealthy too. 
these two little girls on their own. I much prefer people do it on their own. But um, these two little girls, five and eight, I, uh, it's, it's a unique time in my life. I'm able to spend time with them, and I love it, and I love being part of their lives. And I'm on school board that, in the school that they're going to, so I'm doing everything I can to contribute to, to the whole thing, financially too, you know, helping the school helping other people be able to go to school. And um, so, I, I, you know, what do we want for our kids? You want them to grow up and be independent, healthy, able to sustain their own life on their own without being trust fund kids. I'm not a trust fund kid. I don't really, that, I don't relate to that. So inheriting money seems it's a, it's a weird conflict. You don't want to be selfish. You obviously, when I die, I'd like for my wife and my kids to con, you know, continue to have a good life. <clears throat> but I, my main objective is to get them educated. You know, you can give people money and they can buy a, buy a meal. What's that famous quote? Give someone a dollar and they can buy a meal. Give them education, they'll buy meals for the rest of their life. To a large degree, I hear all of this stuff my own little two cents worth, so-called reparations for, for our racism past as a country. I don't think that's a particularly good idea. I think the thing to do is to make sure that every single person, you know, black person who, who grew up, some ancestor of theirs grew up as a slave, the reparation is you make damn sure they have all got a good education. And we're failing when we don't do that. And that's that would be my, if I were in politics, I would argue for that. Because I know what it mean, what it meant to me. And I grew up dirt poor. I mean, my mom would send me, two of my friends, to the supermarket with 25 cents a piece to buy three cans of biscuits. Because you could buy them for three, three cans for 25 cents, but that was your limit. So. She would give it to, we'd go in and buy nine, because that's what we ate for breakfast. And, and um, you know, it, it's, it's not easy. And you, you look at every person, I don't care what walk of life they're from, they deserve to tr be lifted out of that. I had the wherewithal to lift myself out of it, but not everyone does, and you gotta give them a hand. And that's super important. It's, part, it's the kind of society I wanna be part of. So, you know, but it does take work. So, you know, but the first thing is get them an education, teach them to want to learn. And then it's self-sustaining when people realize the reward in developing knowledge and acquiring knowledge. But I don't have, have that much, I mean, you, there's a book out called, I think it's called Educated. My wife gave it to me. She's been saying, you should write a book. I said, like, I'm not ready to write a book. <laughs> I would rather, you know, be part of getting rid of passwords than writing a book about me. <laughs> but um, there's an inspirational message in doing it the way I did it. I wouldn't recommend it for anybody. I'd rather see people get an education, learn the value of education when they're young, and provide them the resources to get the education. If it need, you know, put them through school. I, you know, I'm, I'm much more in favor of giving people an education than I am giving them money. <laughs> and um, I, I kind of think everyone should go to college. Why not? You know, uh, there are people who say, well, they can't get through college. Well, how do you know? You know, I wasn't, I think there are a lot of people would 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 who sh, who <laughs> whose mouth went agape when they learned that I had become a professor at Stanford. <laughs> you know, it's just it wasn't what people expected of me, but it pays off, and and I, that's so that's that's my main main message to the world is don't just be smug in your own ability to have an education because you came from a good family. Bill Gates, for example. 
worry about those people who don't have that opportunity and fix it. That's how we're going to be a great country, don't you think? Do. Yeah. If you had had an easier education, you had gotten a good education at the start, would you become an entrepreneur? Well, you know, I, I don't think you can answer that, but <clears throat> I kind of think your personality is inbred. Uh, I, give, I give myself, I say it's from drive, trying to get out of plain view. Part of that's in jest. Uh, your, your, your character is kind of what it is. I do honestly believe, like I, there are things that I should have learned in high school I still don't know. The, the, the Greek classics and certain things that you learn along that way. Like, you know, I don't know them. And I'd like to, but I, I don't take the time now to do it. Even though I'm, I read quite a bit, but I don't um, go back and read the Greek classics. And I was on a um, sort of apropos your, your, or pertinent to your question. I was on a panel where all of the people that were on the, the I wasn't on the panel, sorry. I was in the audience and there was a panel of people who were talking about Facebook. It was one of the found, one of the early people at Facebook. And they were just marveling. There were a bunch of venture guys. They were marveling at how, this one guy was raving about how people spent 10 hours a day on Facebook. And so I said, do you think if you had spent 10 hours a day on Facebook, you would have done what you did? <laughs> And that was one of the most, they were like a, tossing a smoke bomb in the stage, you know, people, who, who brought this guy? <laughs> it, it, but it's the way I feel. I mean, you, you, you kind of get what you work for and you want to waste your day on Facebook. I'm not a Facebook user and you can call me an old fogey, an old fashioned guy, but I know how to program probably better than 90% of the programmers out there because I spent years and years and years doing it and refining it, and it's an art. Um, so I'm probably getting a little slower at it than I used to be, but, but um, you know, it takes effort. Everything requires effort. And you get what you put in, in my, in my experience. So don't expect things to just fall in your lap. Um, one way or another, you're going to have to work for it. Well, this seems like a natural way to finish. Thank you so much, Jim. On behalf of CHM, we want to thank you for your generosity of your time and telling your remarkable story. Thank you. Thank you for wonderful, Sounds great. wonderful. It was amazing. Yeah.